Hello. Hello. Hi, just wanted to make sure that my microphone worked. It's Mercedes. It didn't work last week. Great. Uh, this is Jenny Chin Hansen. Hello there. Welcome to the California Endowment, our host. Thank you so much for hosting this, our fourth of currently seven scheduled uh, Master Plan for Aging Stakeholder Advisory Committee member, a real pivot point. We are seeing more people come on the line, so we'll let that continue to, to grow. I'm Kim McCoy Wade from the California Department of Aging, and I'm thrilled to have uh, all of you here from far and wide for uh, a really important meeting where, in some ways, we roll up our sleeves and get to work in a new way, uh, beginning to move on recommendations today and hearing more from our equity work group, among other things. Let's see if we can advance the slide. This will be our logistics check-in. I think everyone's familiar with this room, both in terms of restrooms and emergency exits. Uh, look around to make sure that you are. And uh, from a meeting logistics on the phone, we are now, I hope, getting, our, uh, getting practiced at Zoom, including where the materials are posted on our agency website and uh, captioning provided and public comment. Actually, today we're going to do public comment at both halves of the meeting, so more opportunities. And as always, uh, written feedback is welcome. Why don't we start with introductions? We uh, have both um, uh, lots of folks in the room and on the phone from our Stakeholder Advisory Committee. I do want to provide one update that um, Dr. Arevalo has uh, submitted his resignation. He has new responsibilities in his day job, uh, and turns out being on the SAC is a, basically a second job, as many of you can attest. Uh, so we were, are very thankful for his service and appreciate uh, his continued support and partnership in other ways. And then I also wanted to introduce one new CDA team member who started um, an hour ago. Uh, she is the uh, California Department of Aging Master Plan for Aging Project Director, Amanda Lawrence, who's sitting here at the table with us. Yay! She comes to us most recently from the Department of Public Health, where she was leading their Healthy Aging Initiative and was, again, our first presenter on our first webinar Wednesday on healthy aging on topics like falls and opioids and dementia. So uh, comes to us uh, uh, and is already planning the public health and master plan convening for the spring. So I was ready to hit the ground uh, and also brings a good background in yoga. So will help us all with our life, work-life balance as well. We're very equally important. All right, so with that, let me kick off introductions to my right, Susan. Good morning. Oh, yes. Good morning. I'm Susan DeMorris representing the Alzheimer's Association. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Cheryl Brown, and I'm representing the um, California Commission on Aging, and I'm a former assembly member. Good morning, Leandra Clark Harvey, California Council on Community Behavioral Health Agencies. Hi, good morning. I'm Shelley Lyford, representing the Gary and Mary West Foundation in San Diego. Catherine Blakemore, representing Disability Rights California. Kevin Prinigo with Justice and Aging. Nina Wilder Harwell, AARP California. Peter Hansel Calpace, representing the programs of all inclusive care for the elderly. Donna Benton, University of Southern California, and the California Association of uh, Caregiver Resource Centers. Rigo Saborio with St. Barnabas Senior Services in LA, and also with the Los Angeles Aging Advocacy Coalition. 
Derek Lamb with ACC Cena Services in Sacramento. Jeannie Parker Martin with Leading Age California. Bruce Chernoff with the SCAMP Foundation. Clay Kemp, Seniors Council, also representing California Association of Area Agencies on Aging. Judy Thomas, Coalition for Compassionate Care of California. Yeah, I'll keep it. Okay. Oh, no, it's all right. Okay. Um, okay. Testing. 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 Marty Lynch from Lifelong Medical Care and the Community Health Center world. Heather Young, University of California, Davis, and board member of the Archstone Foundation. Good morning. Christina Boss Hamilton, UDW, United Domestic Workers, AFSCME, uh, representing IHSS workers. Ellen Goodwin with the Department of Aging. Amanda Lawrence with the Department <laughs> of Aging. Yeah. I'm Carrie Graham from University of California and acting as a consultant to CDA. Wonderful. Thank you. And I want to acknowledge that some of my leadership team is not here, uh, part of the agency's coordinated response to the coronavirus. So uh, with us in spirit, but doing uh, good work this morning under leadership of public health. So, so thanks. Uh, and we've got, uh, Nelson, can you tell us which of our, uh, let's see if I can read that. It looks like, um, can you unmute the SAC members who are on the phone with a good, nice list? Christina? Hi, good morning, everyone. Christina Mills. Sorry, I can't be there in person. Welcome. And this is Debbie Toth, and there's construction in the background because I'm outside, so I'll be there in about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mercedes Kerr, is she, is she able to be unmuted? Uh, yes, if I can this time around. This is Mercedes Kerr with Belmont Village. I'm sorry, I can't be there in person, but happy to participate. Thank you. And I believe Brandy Wolf is trying to get in at least by cell phone. So uh, is Brandy visible yet? We, she's uh, calling in, so she'll be in as she can. Okay. So let's take a moment and orient ourselves to the day. We are right now doing welcome introductions and overview. It's been a busy time, so I want to take some time and uh, walk you through an uh, overall progress report. You have in front of you our soft launch of our progress report that I'll walk you through in just a moment. Uh, then we're going to spend a significant amount of time on process in, in a couple senses. Uh, one, the overall master plan process. I mentioned that it's, it's March and we're on a timeline uh, through October. So making sure we are all situated and following uh, the overall process, particularly since we now have seven different work groups or committees working. Uh, and so I want to make sure that that becomes clearer to everybody. It's been a busy February. But then we want to pivot and actually start to put some process to work in terms of SAC, SAC acting on recommendations. So we're going to talk about how SAC takes action. And then we're going to put it into process and we're going to hear an in-depth uh, uh, presentation to key up the discussion on a set of recommendations coming forward on uh, goal one or long-term services and supports. Uh, that will be led in partnership with um, the subcommittee leadership, including Susan DeMaris, and about eight of you who are on SAC, who are also on the LTSS subcommittee, and then we have other members in the audience. We'll take public comment on the report. We'll have a lunch break. Thank you again to our funders who are making it possible for us to have working meetings. Uh, and then we'll come back after lunch and take action. Uh, again, we'll tee up how that happens. Then uh, all those other uh, work groups that I mentioned, goal two, goal three, goal four, together we engage. Research, equity, we'll give a quick update, uh, mostly coming from SAC members. Everyone's been busy. And then again, we'll close with public comment and a summation of next steps. So with that, let's turn to Nelson, my, my uh, advancer isn't advancing, which might be me. There we go. So uh, again, this is uh, hot off the presses. As I mentioned, this is a soft launch. We like we did one before in the fall, and now here we are in the spring, uh, trying to uh, provide a high-level uh, update on all the things that are happening. We welcome your feedback on this. If you see anything that needs to be tweaked or improved, uh, and before we officially publish later this week, uh, we would welcome that. 
but you'll see that we're summarizing uh, the, uh, the, the executive order that got us to this point and the high level timeline with March uh, bumped out because this is the March report. We have our framework and our messages around aging is changing with growing diversity, more living alone and more facing poverty and a story from one of the clients that we serve at CDA. We uh, highlight our new equity work group and all the ways that we're engaging from the new website, the webinar Wednesdays, uh, we're again about halfway through those, uh, and the roundtable discussions, which we have picked up the pace as well. I was uh, thrilled to be in Santa Clara County on Friday with Senator Bell, and next Monday, uh, my secretary will be with Senator Pam here in Sacramento. And then we begin to show um, some of the issues that we're hearing. Um, no surprise to anyone, uh, some of the top issues that are emerging are around housing and homelessness, home and community living, inclusion, isolation, and purpose, protection from abuse, neglect, and exploitation, and emergency preparedness, response, and recovery. And there's some of the polling that shows the urgency of those issues. And then we also have these cross-cutting themes that are inc increasingly coming out around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion dementias and all cognitive impairments, technology, cross-generation connections, and economic transformation, including workforce. Those themes come up in every conversation. So again, early days, but that's some of a reflection back. Uh, and then as you know, we are collaborating, coordinating with many governors initiative, first and foremost, the Governor's Task Force on Alzheimer's. The, the coordination and collaboration is only deepening and in part through Susan DeMaris, who uh, is the sole person on both. So thank you, Susan, for that critical bridge role. And we are actually seeking to expand our private sector partnership. That hasn't been a huge focus yet, and we, it's a critical part of the work. So uh, in part, thanks to our philanthropic, uh, philanthropy, philanthropy partnerships, uh, we're, we're expanding private sector in the coming quarter. And the CDA strategic plan continues, and an early, early preview of Save the Date for June 17th. Planning is beginning on a statewide event from this room uh, live streamed and broadcast to really engage everybody across the state. So let us know if you have any feedback on that. A couple things I just want to highlight again is the website really is the one-stop shop. It is in English, Spanish, and Chinese. Uh, we're looking now to make sure we have LTSS information more prominently in there, uh, but it really is your go-to place and let us know how it is and is not working for you. Next slide. Oops, back one. Uh, I can't say enough about the webinar Wednesdays, both the incredible work that has gone into them from Jennifer Wong, who's here from us in the uh, audience, as well as how many of you have done a webinar Wednesday, I mean presented on a webinar Wednesday, a good number of yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's a lot of work uh, to sift all the recommendations and public comments that come in and shape a conversation between a state partner, a local leader, the public, and yourselves, the SAC members. But we are getting a tremendous response, both about 200 folks the day of, uh, commenting, polling, quest asking questions, and then continuing to download. Uh, and it's really helping us bridge uh, partnerships. If you haven't had a chance to tune in, I, the materials are all posted. You can check the slide deck. You can listen to the recording. But it's, um, uh, it's a different way we're trying to engage and develop. So thank you for your hard work on that. And if you haven't gone yet, there's still about seven or eight left, so look forward to, including this week again on uh, uh, elder abuse with Kevin. Kevin. Yeah. Yes, he's working on the slides now, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, next slide. And I just do want to do a special shout out to our legislators who have really, um, with the new year, tr uh, we started in September with Senator Hurtado, but now they're uh, coming almost every week and it's absolutely wonderful and many of you are attending as you are able. Uh, Senator Hannah Beth Jackson and our secretary in uh, Santa Barbara. I know Susan and Nina and other folks were able to be at that one. Um, Senator Bell, as I mentioned on Friday, Senator Pan coming up, um, and then Los Angeles and Humboldt County still in the works, and uh, also Assemblymember Grambula in Fresno is also in the works, um, tied to the Alzheimer's event in Fresno that same time. So bridges, bridges, bridges. Um, so thank you to the legislature, and of course hearings are beginning as well, both budget and oversight policy hearings and the Select Committee on Aging, so much there. As I mentioned, uh, housing and homelessness, no surprise, and at the broadest sense of housing, all housing settings, and again reflected in our governor's state of the state, devoted to housing and homelessness, uh, and then as we know, 
um, other top of mind issues. So an interesting snapshot of what people on our website are interested in. And then again, these cross-cutting themes that are more just a reflection, uh, next slide, on what we're hearing in so many conversations about really transforming aging, not just working on a set of policies, but reimagining, reinventing. Uh, and to that end, you know, we'll hear more, we're looking to build that work more into the SAC as well with equity presentations, um, thinking about how to have that joint Alzheimer's conversation with the governor's task force, uh, Jenny Chin Hansen really leading us in intergenerational connection conversation. Uh, David Lindemann will be coming to a May meeting to, um, to blow our minds with technology <laughs> and all the things we can't yet imagine uh, about the opportunities and disruptions of technology. And then again, more work needed with our governor's office and secretary Julie Sue about the economic the implications for the economy. So lots happening. Let me pause there, see if any um, questions, comments, additions to this, the programmatic update. Bruce. Kim, I guess I just wanted to say um, first thanks for that update and um, really all the progress that you all have made. I guess the two questions I'd have for you just as we launch in, how do you feel about where we are in the process? Are we making enough progress? Are we on track in terms of being responsive to what the cabinet level group is doing and what the governor expects? And then linked to that, given all the really good work that we're doing since we're at a midpoint in, in the work in a way, or, or almost at a midpoint, um, are there things that you wish we were doing with regard to engagement that we're not? Is there anything that we, as because we still have some time, right? So is there anything we should be doing that we aren't? Um, so that's a great question. I think part of the uh, answer about where we are is we'll know more at 3 o'clock than I do right now in terms of level setting process and all the work as we've been moving. I see us moving from engagement, although that will continue to now deliverables, producing deliverables, recommendations, and taking action. And so how we make that pivot and hit those markers uh, every month from now on. Um, I think I will say that I want to be sure the partnership work uh, the stakeholder work is intensive, and now that we have seven work groups going and depending on eight if you count, I want to be sure it's those new partners that we have time to spend time with the private sector, that we have time with other states, with other countries. So that's where I'm hoping that as we, um, my team, uh, you know, we do maybe a little less meeting planning and a little more thinking. Uh, and that's what I'm hoping to create more space for. You'll, I'm going to give you, there's a month up here where I say no meetings proposed, uh, and that's partly a bit of um, we need to move from input to analysis and, uh, and, and frankly, so we can bring you more content back from our team as well. Okay, did everybody have your coffee? You're ready for the process because this is actually really important and I want to make sure we're all on the same page and um, have all the input for how to improve it. Next slide. I'll keep pushing it and see what happens. Okay. And I will, just want to acknowledge there is an ad hoc group of folks who've been hopping on the phone with me to think through process. So uh, if, as we go through this, some of them may um, chime in and uh, flush this out, but this has been really helpful to have uh, some informal kitchen cabinet advisors to, uh, how to how to do this. Okay. Let's start at the super high level. This is this timeline graphic that you may have seen for a long time which says, oh, it's very simple. There's just these five things that are going to happen. Uh, an executive order is going to come out uh, in this June. Check. <laughs> and then there's this fall and winter bar <laughs> where all of the engagement is coming in and then recommendations are starting to be developed by the subcommittees and work groups. March is highlighted because it's called out in the executive order as the one time a formal stakeholder report has been requested. Um, that's the focus of today's meeting. And then this summer, another bar where all of these threads, I've been calling it all the creeks coming together into a river, uh, get integrated uh, into one mighty California river. Uh, and then October 2020 is the date where the executive order calls for it to be issued. So let's go down a level. <laughs> what is actually happening uh, below those bars? Here's where I would describe the SAC process as a three-step. Step one, what we've been calling the together engage Let's get all the input and advice we can. 
uh, let's have online public comments and recommendations. And we're suggesting that we take those kind of through April 22nd, which is the last webinar Wednesday. Like, let's keep it coming. Flow is great. Um, the LTSS subcommittee has been meeting to discuss goal one. Webinar Wednesdays have been getting input on goal two, health and well-being, goal three, livable communities and purpose, and goal four, economic security and safety. The research subcommittee has been meeting on the data dashboard and data gaps, and also wants to and will be proposing a research agenda, thanks to the leadership of Dr. Laura Carstensen uh, at our most recent meeting at Stanford last week. The equity work group has kicked off and is uh, on the way to developing an equity tool to use to inform and advise. And again, community roundtables, coordination with governor's task force, lots of other local, state, international models we're trying to uh, review. And then um, save the date for this event. We'll talk about more today as a final kind of go back to the public and say, we think we heard you. Here's what we think we heard. Did we get it right? What did we miss? What else do we need to include or amplify or modify? So that's input. There's a lot of streams, a lot of creeks, a lot, a lot of great stuff coming. Now, here's where we are, next slide, on step two. Various subcommittees and work groups of SAC are taking all of those streams and developing them into recommendations. And the one to go first was the LTSS subcommittee. They began meeting in October, if I remember right, working towards this March deadline for the report. The research subcommittee began in November and is working now on data dashboard and research. And then look what happened in February. <laughs> the equity work group kicked off to develop their equity tool and three other SAC work groups began work to integrate all of that input on, um, oh gosh, goal, goal three got kicked off the slide somehow. Goal three, welcome back, you're still with us. Uh, and uh, healthy, uh, I don't know what happened, but health and well-being, so we'll correct that slide. Uh, but goal two, three, and four are all up and running. And then we convened uh, another small group of SAC to help us think through what could this statewide event look like on June 17th. Oops, sorry, next slide. Okay, so then go step three of this process is SAC takes action. They get the recommendation from that subcommittee or that group. So here we are March 2nd, about two thirds through that busy slide and goal one is coming to you for action. And we'll talk in a second about what that means. In May, seeing that goal two, goal three, goal four and data are all coming, our kitchen cabinet group said, I think that's more than one meeting and suggested that we add a second meeting. So we have tentatively put that on your calendars of May 28th, but May 18th, the previously announced meeting would be goal two, health and well-being, uh, as well as data dashboards and research. And then we've asked um, the SCAN Foundation who's done some scanning. <laughs> oh, do I? Yeah, so I think we're goal three, health and well-being. I'm so yeah. sorry. It's not goal, yeah, it just switched on here. Okay, yeah. so all these... Two is livable community, goal three is health and well-being. Yeah. That, that beep went off for it? That was the like... <laughs> yeah, and, and while you're at it, could you just clarify the May 18 and May 28, how that work meeting? Yeah. So I'm sorry for the, the errors in the slides, we'll fix those, but the idea is that with goal two recommendations coming, and goal two is all together now, community. livable communities and purpose, uh, they would come on May 18th with their recommendations. Okay. And the research subcommittee will come with data dashboard. Okay. Then goal three, which I mistakenly switched, thank you Maya, which is led by Maya and Fernando, so they are playing, paying close attention, uh, is on, would be scheduled for May 28th to bring their recommendations, as would goal four, which is Kevin, and we'll talk about his team to be named later. Uh, and we've asked David Linderman to come and do the technology talk. So what the, the idea is we need a second meeting in May to handle all of that content. So that if you look at the March, May, May meeting, March 2nd, goal one, March 18th, goal two, and data dashboard, May 28th, goal three, and goal four. So that by the end of May, the SAC has heard recommendations from their small groups and given some direction and taken some action. And then we have the last meeting in August to pull it all together. A couple more data points and then we'll pause for discussion. 
Meanwhile, that's all the SAC process. Meanwhile, we're working with the cabinet, right? So the cabinet's meeting quarterly. We are meeting all the time with governor's other initiatives, such as the task force on Alzheimer's, DHCS CalAIM. I wanna again thank them for being in the room. I see Anastasia and DHCS, thank you. Our colleagues at CDSS with their IHSS listening sessions and more. Our governor's office of philanthropy and public-private partnership, more. So lots of administration coordination. We also, as uh, you may know, we launched our monthly meeting with all CHHS departments on aging and disability. We're about started that in October and November. So that's an ongoing coordination on all things master plan. And then just last month, our agency data subcommittee said, gee, seems like you need an aging disability data work group, which we couldn't agree with more. So that is also kicking off. <laughs> then, you know, aging is very in right now. So we <laughs> are having lots of issue specific meetings. So our good friends at Office of Emergency Services thought a convening on access and functional needs would be a great idea and we agreed. So we convened with them, all departments, to talk about access and functional needs and emergency preparedness. Uh, intergenerational connections, our colleagues and young children at the agency and governor's office are very interested in opportunities to do cross generation. So we're having meetings with them particularly around possible volunteer. So those sort of single topic things are popping up. So our team is doing all of that uh, conversation with our cabinet as well. Next slide, Nelson. So then here's how it all comes together. See what you think. Preview, preview, nothing etched in stone here. So June and September, we get to work writing. <laughs> Having heard all of your recommendations at the March and May meetings, we are outlining and drafting. In June, we bring it to the public to make sure it resonates. In July, we have a vision of no scheduled meetings. <laughs> oh, I like to put that on a slide just to see how that goes. Uh, August 11th is the last SAC meeting and shortly thereafter is the last cabinet meeting in August. <clears throat> and then October 1st is the date in the executive order. And then another new uh, opportunity that's come our way is our foundation partners are proposing that uh, the October 20th gathering really be purposed as an MPA implementation and partnership forum and kind of move, pivot from if June 17th is the engagement, October 20 is the implementation. And we try to have that, that um, rhythm uh, with, our, with our public and all partners. Okay, let me just stop. Everyone digest, <laughs> pull that ask questions, correct the slides and repost. <laughs> yes, thank you, Maya. Uh, Maya needs a mic. Oh, oh I have her mic. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Run away. <laughs> So who's writing? Uh, the plan is administration document. Okay, so when you say June, July, that's the, so you're going to take, <clears throat> we're not going to do, I mean, the LTSS report is a written report. It's not just recommendations. So I'm just trying to um, envision the, um, the other goals as being more recommendations that then you would take and shape into a report. That is our, that is our expectation as well, that the report is a major body of work that comes in from the LTSS stakeholders. The goal two, goal three, and goal four work groups will deliver the product that makes sense to you all. You're not directed to give a report in the executive order, so it could be a different format. Okay. And then it ultimately is the administrations to produce the, the plan. Uh, Kim, thanks. Uh, could you clarify, um, so if we do LTSS today and in the month of March, you get these other goal recommendations in over the next few months. Are you imagining any tweaking of LTSS uh, down the line, shall we say, even though we have this March deadline in? Um, we, you will see when we get to that part that they are absolutely asking and proposing that they continue to meet and continue to give input. So I think that will be a question is if there, we need some May time for some goal one updates 
or if August is adequate. So, no, I think the LTSS subcommittee people are nodding at me that they don't, that their work continues. Mm -hmm. Nina. Thank you. Nina Wilder-Harwa with ARP. So as part of our report, I really appreciate that we, it looks like we've, you've calendared an implementation partnership forum. Will there be opportunities within the writing groups to also begin thinking through implementation and sending some of those ideas up? That's a great question. I think um, the implementation content or the forum? I mean, I'm hoping that your master plan recommendations speak to implementation and sequencing and, and um, I think what we had been thinking is that together we engage work group who's advising on June 17th would also advise on the October 20, but there's also a thought of having a more public planning process for the October 20 event um, to make sure it's as inclusive and as possible and participatory as possible. Um, so I'm not exactly sure, but I'm hoping that the recommendations that are coming ha have implementation recommendations. Oh. Does that answer, Nina? So I, <laughs> I'm having, here we go. <laughs> um, so I know that our recommendations have kind of short, mid, long-term, and recommendations about agencies, but even within that, there has to be even deeper thought about how you really implement. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was asking what I was asking. Yeah, and again, th this, um, this, this forum has really just been proposed from our philanthropy partners, and I think it's, they're seeing it as a kickoff event. So what that looks like and what the shape of that is, and are there tracks, and are there breakouts, or is it local communities, I think is all very TBD. Okay. Thank you. Maybe just to add to that, I think on behalf of all the foundations that are here at the table, their board members and those that may be in the room or watching, you know, we, I think, believe very strongly in the work that the SAC has done. It, it's actually amazing that we're all sitting here making this progress. And we have a real opportunity to hold, to use that word, the cabinet and the governor himself and his administration accountable for all the work that we've done. Um, and so we think that actually having a really public event to talk about why this is so important is key. And I think on behalf of all the foundations, we care, we welcome any input and any process, Kim, that you and the team put together. We just think having that public discussion and rollout is really, really important. And, and in trade, giving as many people in the public a chance and advocates who aren't in the room but who care and want to, like, how do we create a broader dialogue around this? So um, if any of the other foundations want to weigh in, that's fine. But I think that's the logic behind this, is we need public energy on the other side of release, whatever that looks like. Okay. Right. Oh, Janie, sorry. Thank you. Janie thank you, Peter. Janie Castillo. Uh, thank you for the comments. I was curious about, as we move forward from this point forward, how are we going to merge and prioritize the recommendations to the point to where we can release them? Can can we can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, let me just make sure I hear your question right. Are you asking about how the SAC will prioritize across goals, or are you asking? I think in general, mm -hmm. um, because I know a lot of information is coming in mm -hmm. from many sources across California, even probably outside of California. And I'm just curious as to the process of merging and prioritizing those. Right. Um, so I would say two partial answers and not a complete answer. So today we're going to have the first exercise in hearing the goal one LTSS report, how they framed out the work, set objectives, not to steal your thunder, uh, and then actually suggested some immediate opportunities and go through a process with that. So that's sort of a first chance to do that. And you'll see in a second, we're going to see how that goes and refine it for goal two, goal three, goal four, and dashboard. Okay. Um, but I think the question you're asking about is across. We currently have that plan for kind of the synthesis meeting is August, mm -hmm. but I think that's a fair question if after we've heard everything in March and May, 
what more might need to happen before August to make sure that's a real true mm -hmm. integrated conversation. Okay. So let, oh, Peter. Oh, thanks. Um, Peter Hansel, CalPACE. Um, some of the topics and themes that are emerging from the goal areas are, are overlapping with broader administration um, goals and priorities, so certainly housing and hom homelessness, as you mentioned, emergency planning, I'm assuming. Is the cabinet discussion process connected? Is there like a broader cabinet discussion going on that, 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 that the master plan on aging is connected to, or how, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, currently staff is really, an, um, myself and the agency team are really the bridge to that. So yes, we have quarterly cabinet meetings where uh, housing and transportation and emergency services and labor and volunteers are all at the table. Um, the Wednesday webinars, you see are actually where a lot of those deeper conversations are starting to come about deeper approaches. Um, we've featured many members of the cabinet so far. Uh, LTSS is a little bit interesting because it's primarily within agency, not, not entirely, but primarily within agency while the other ones um, can cross more, particularly livable communities. Um, so all that cabinet stuff is, is happening. I would expect when we have the livable communities conversation here, there would be cabinet representatives here because it touches housing and transportation. Again, today we're talking about long-term services and supports, which is primarily a, an agency. Not entirely, many housing, you know. But so that's running alongside, and I think one of the questions that Bruce has had and others have had too about how to make that stronger and more visible. So very open to continued ways to do that. But sharing the, some of the things here on the slide, the webinar Wednesday role where you can see the cabinet all, um, showing up, and then I think thinking with our work group leads, um, uh, Nina and Jenny, about how to involve them in the SAC meeting in a strategic way would be a, the next steps on my mind. Are there others on process? Because we're not done with process. Now we're talking about process today. <laughs> no public comment at this point. This is all SAC. Uh, Debbie, thank you. So I need a mic. You need a mic? Okay. I'm sorry, dude. Oh, was it on? Just takes me a minute, sorry. Um, so through the webinar Wednesday process, my experience, and I'll speak solely from my experience, was that the cabinet level folks have a very different lens for um, the services and supports on the ground floor. And how do we have an opportunity to provide them um, a different lens through which to look. My, my concern is that at the cabinet level, they're not seeing what we're seeing on the ground floor in service provision. Um, they can see reports or whatever, but they're looking at the programs and things that they run and not putting it in the context of the people who are utilizing the services. And I don't say that as a whatever, something derogatory, it's just a reality. And so I would like, I would like for the stakeholder advisory committee to have an opportunity to ensure that we feel a level of confidence in the cabinet level people who are running this, that they understand also the nexus to the actual people who are utilizing those services. Thank you. Uh, friendly reminder from our audience to introduce yourself with your name and organization oh. before. Debbie Toast, Choice and Aging. Thank, Thank you. you. Not directed at you. Jody, are you? I am, but I, did you, were you responding to her before I say something? I don't know that I, ha I think. Me too? Point taken, yes. Okay, <laughs> okay good. <laughs> I mean, we, you know, I think the webinar Wednesday is doing that, and I think perhaps coming to the main meeting, but if there's other ways to do that, let's think about what that would look like. Very open. Jody Reed, Cara, is this on? Try it. Not yet. There you go. Hello, is that better? Okay, Jody Reed, Cara. So I just wanted to point out another task force that doesn't seem to get mentioned that'd be good for us to be at least cooperating with, coordinating with, which is the um, Healthy California Commission that was recently seated and had its first meeting. Because I think in terms of healthcare integration, and um, healthcare financing, since some of what we're doing intersects there, that we should make sure we're talking to each other there as well. 
100% agree. We are very fortunate with, uh, with that one that Jenny Chin Hansen is also on that one. Our, our key strategy is getting as many of you as possible on another commission <laughs> to help us be the bridge <laughs> since we're having a harder time cloning ourselves. Uh, so having Jenny at that table, and I want to shout out another one, the new Behavioral Health Task Force that Dr. Leandra Clark Harvey was just named to. So thank you, Dr. Clark Harvey, in advance. Uh, for your service, and if, I've, if, uh, if anybody else here is on one of the governor's commissions, uh, please let me know. I don't mean to over, overlook that, but I think those links are really important, and we are trying to make sure that we are mirror imaging the whole way. I mean, again, last week was our webinar Wednesday on isolation and inclusion and respect, and it featured Dr. Clark Harvey uh, as our SAC member, as well as the agency lead for the Behavioral Task Force, John Connolly. Um, so we are looking to, to make those partnerships. Hi, in Santa Cruz County. Yeah, I can I be heard here? Yes. Oh, oh great. great. Yes, uh, I've been on, um, but I just wanted to say yes. I'm very mindful of that, and uh, it it does turn out that uh, I happen to be the one commissioner who has probably the greater body of work related to aging. So, um, um, and keeping an eye on that. Um, there's discussion about Medicare, Medicaid. You can imagine I, my antenna are up high. <laughs> and we can think about too whether report outs on that would be helpful at a future meeting or some other way to make sure we're strengthening that bridge between creeks or streams, rivers. Um, that would be great. <laughs> Okay, well, let's keep going on process to, oh, Clay, sorry. At the risk of beating a dead Introduce yourself. Thanks. Clay Kemp, Seniors Council of Santa Cruz and San Benito Counties. Uh, at the risk of beating a dead horse here with the, um, the cabinet level discussions, I just wonder if each cabinet or, or at least some of them are creating their own master plan or their own plan on addressing aging issues. And I ask that for two reasons. One is just because I'm really confident in this group and your leadership that'll keep the plan vibrant and, and ongoing, but I want to make sure that other departments feel the same way. And I'm also thinking to something the Commission on Aging did 15 years ago where they had a, a transportation task team. Uh, we call it a triple T, which really tried to do that to make sure that transportation systems were engaged in better serving older adults and people with disabilities. So uh, kind of two questions, you know, what's the plan to engage them and hold them accountable along with all of us and whether they're doing that through a written document or just through providing input into what Master Plan for Aging says? Uh, yes, at the highest level, as the executive order spells out, it's a cabinet work group plan. So the, the master plan for aging would have um, goals that impact the work directly of other agencies. And so that's why where there's so much dialogue right now is to making sure that these goals do make sense in their world, align with their world, their state plans, their, uh, and some of them may be new commitments, some of them may be new priorities, some of them may be new indicators. So, but that is absolutely, it's not just, um, that there will be agency commitments across the cabinet. Scanning for raised name tags and hands. Let's turn to practicing. Okay, so that's the high level. Let's get concrete. Today is gonna to be a pilot process as the LTSS subcommittee brings forward their draft stakeholder report for the SAC consideration. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> and we will no doubt refine it for our upcoming May meetings when goal two, goal three, goal four, the dashboard, and uh, the August synthesis meeting as well. So take notes on what's working, what's not working. Um, I will say right now that the LTSS subcommittee had the hardest deadline. So we know people are getting materials later than they would like, including some that are at your desk for the first time that here that we're gonna project on the screen. Uh, we have already instructed the goal two, three, four work groups that their deadline is May 1st. Three months from now, entirely, two months? Three months, April, two months, entirely reasonable. Uh, <laughs> so that there is some more time for SAC to have it in advance 
and process it and think about it before the meeting. So we, that is a process improvement that we're all committed to, but also completely appreciative and amazed that the LTSS folks even hit this deadline. So, uh, but more process improvements and ongoing are always welcome. Okay, so then, get this. We asked both the SAC and the LTSS subcommittee what they wanted to see happen, and they told us. And the nice thing is they mostly line up. So SAC said, we briefed on this in detail, and so we did the webinar last Wednesday that about two-thirds of you were able to be on in real time. So thank you for those of you for an additional time. And our process groups gave you all some homework and said, uh, please send your edits to this offline email box so we don't spend a whole lot of time on edits as a group. And think about your top opportunities, your immediate opportunities to act on now so we can perhaps um, take advantage of the moment. Then SAC wanted to discuss the report today with a process for edits and finalization, discuss immediate opportunities, and then get the whole thing in by March, which is the deadline in the executive order. There was a desire to do that, but absolutely continue to support the LTSS subcommittee. This is, uh, if these words aren't quite right, let us know. But that was the SAC vision of what would happen today. The subcommittee also had their own opinion. Uh, next slide, please. Which is what they wanted to do was uh, brief SAC on the stakeholder report. Thank you very much. Uh, bring the draft here. Propose their sense of the immediate opportunity, uh, which you will hear shortly and was some good fast work over the weekend. Then they wanted some time to really finalize the report with graphics, stories, the edits that come in, really produce a legacy document. They also identified a lot of recommend, not a lot, a nice set of recommendations that are really more the province of goal two, three, and four, and they want to be able to make that bridge over to that with uh, that content and some cross membership. They want to continue to advise SAC on LTSS, come back with more thoughts. Um, and then they also want to continue to work with the research subcommittee on the data indicators. That work is just also beginning. So mostly aligned. Any questions on comp? The next thing we're going to do is start doing it. <laughs> we're going to talk about the report and hear about it from uh, Susan and her colleagues. But are there any um, questions or comments about that? Yes, Bruce. And Oh, sorry, Vigo and then Bruce. And please identify yourself. Hi, Kim. The only thing that I think it's missing from here and in terms of being intentional is actually doing direct work with the equity work group and because uh, the other work groups are noted here. And so I see that sort of as a, it's missing. So I just want to make sure that. Well, it, it was, I'm sorry, it was, it was missing because it was, it, hap it was perceived as happening. Oh. But that's a really important question if you think it's coming back to equity. Because at the first equity meeting on Feb 13, LTSS subcommittee came, presented, um, uh, thank you again to both equity and LTSS. Um, yes is the answer. Yes, yes. Um, but the next LTSS subcommittee meeting is March 17th. So that is a question is if I don't think the subcommittee was anticipating coming back to equity, but maybe they are. So we should talk about that. Right, because I think the equity work group is also meeting on the 17th, so, you know, maybe there's an opportunity. That's what I mean, the equity yeah, group yeah. is 17. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So I think that'll be a good time to go back. But I, I, I see that the work with the, equ the equity work group is an ongoing process, so it's not just a one time. Correct. And so as, uh, as this is taking shape and form over the next several months continuously, that I think it just should be called out. That's my thing. On the yes. Equity. Yes. I think the, what, the, the challenge we're facing is, um, I'm facing, is when, it, when we're consulting and when we're deciding. And so who is deciding when what's in this report? Yeah, I, think, so I think that's really one of the things we have to figure out today is if there's a consensus decision that this draft with some edits and some, or if they go to equity in mid-March, how that's landed I think is one of the questions. Well, Bruce, speak up. And then more. Do you want to say something? Else? No, that's fine. Kim, before we Bruce turn off uh, TSF. Before we launch in, I guess the question I have is that um, the master plan is obviously meant to have a longer time horizon. We have a specific opportunity, decade, 
right? So that this is work that would happen over years and budget cycles and administrations. We're laying a blueprint. Um, particularly with the LTSS subcommittee, given the way it's called out in the executive order, there is a need to make recommendations now. And shame on us if we don't see opportunities in the May revise and the budgeting process to get some stuff done. Like we don't have to wait 10 years to get some stuff done. I guess I'd love to hear you think, get, before we start, if you could give us some guidance about how do we sort of suspend animation between, we don't want a master plan that's just about immediate priorities because that then fails to give us a vision and we don't want a, um, a master plan that's just set 10 years in the future, which means everybody gets a pass and nothing needs to happen in the near term. So maybe, I'd just love to hear you talk a little bit about that so that we have a common platform when we, as we go into this presentation. Yeah, the way we have been thinking about it in partnership with SAC and LTSS is that we're in some ways having two conversations today, and that's partly why there's two bullets. There's the report itself, the draft you have in front of you that you've seen, that you were briefed on, that you've had time with, that lays out a five-part objective framework. We want to spend some time on that because that is really, I believe, and Susan can talk more about this, the recommended framework for the master plan to engage with LTSS for a 10-year plan. And so we should reflect on what you heard last Wednesday, look at it again, and have that discussion. That's really bullet two, bring draft report to SAC for discussion and action. Bullet three is this other question of our part two, are there immediate opportunities to call out? And as Bruce said, the question of a 10-year horizon and immediate are quite different. And we want to have that conversation of immediate in the context of the five-part framework, but it's, it is separate. So uh, Susan and I have talked about kind of part one, pause, part two. Uh, to, and then we can go back and forth, but they really are related but different if that's how we're thinking about it. Judy. Hi. Judy Thomas, Coalition for Compassionate Care. I like seeing the bullet about referring recommendations because I've struggled a little bit with like, do my comments fit in here or go somewhere else? But I'd like to suggest kind of my vision was maybe some sort of crosswalk. So it's not just here are issues that don't go in this report, they go in that report. It's not just punting. But what we're doing here is so massive and interrelated right that um, I'd like to see some sort of mechanism that helps us be able to conceptualize that. These have to be in discrete buckets, but also that sense of this is all interrelated. So uh, the idea of crosswalk is kind of what came to me to maybe help do that. Yes, I would love to get more feedback from you on that because there's two things that are underway. One, the LTSS subcommittee has done a list, a document that policy crosswalks that says where they believe these issues go and connect, that that has, I don't know that that was, I can't remember if that was shared on the webinar. I'm having a, was not. So that is a document that exists in terms of that narrow question. More broadly, um, that is a top priority of our team is how we figure out this cross-pollination. Um, You'll see it when we go through our updates, but really we are, every work group has a connection to equity and to research um, so that we are making sure we have an equity and data-driven lens on every one of the four work groups. But this question of between the four and when that happens is, is a live one. Okay. Are we ready? Okay, without further ado. Uh, <coughs> presenting, drum roll, the LTSS Service and Support Stakeholder Report for SAC discussion. Again, reminder, we're going to have an open discussion and public comment and break for lunch. We will not be trying to take action until after lunch unless it is obvious, but giving ourselves plenty of time. And I want to call out um, on this slide, uh, Carrie Graham, who's done incredible work as the consultant uh, supporting the subcommittee, Susan, one of the joint members, co-captains, leaders, and Jeannie Parker-Martin, who's been advising SAC on how to process. So we're going to tag team. Next slide. So the report, uh, it was provided as of last week, uh, a, a draft. This is um, a mostly time the revised draft that is publicly available and posted. There was an hour and a half webinar briefing last Wednesday, which again, two thirds of you appeared to be on and had great questions and comments. And the mechanism for edits um, with the idea that, of course, it's really important there be corrections and accuracy in language, 
um, and uh, we will be receiving them on behalf of the LTSS subcommittee through this Wednesday close of business. So please do uh, read with your eagle eye and send those in so that the report is as strong as possible. Then we really do have to take a moment to uh, look and marvel at the list of people who have dedicated the last four months of their lives to writing, rewriting, collaborating, convening, yeah. um, weekend meetings, early morning phone calls. Uh, please look at this list of people. Yes. Old, a number of them are, are joint members of SAC and LTSS, so really appreciate those folks playing the pivot. Um, but really, it has been a team effort. Um, uh, Lydia Missalides and Claire Ramsey and Sarah Steenhausen are not on the SAC, but have really shouldered an, an incredible amount of writing and co-captaining. Uh, but really, thank you to all of you. Uh, uh, you really have put us in an incredible place for an expert and collaborative and strategic discussion. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So with that, Susan is going to walk you through briefly, because you were, most of you were there Wednesday, the report framework, that long-term framework, and then we'll pause, and then we'll walk us through the immediate opportunities as part two. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, so the report that you have, the 30-page version, should be familiar to the report that the SAC reviewed. It's, it's substantially similar to the first draft that was brought to you. What's different is we had a graphic at that time, um, and we have a new graphic now. We were urged at the last meeting to come up with big ideas, and so the work group came up with five big ideas, which we have called objectives, and they are illustrated in this graphic image here. And they, in one word, we were able to um, describe the big objectives that we'll be going through shortly. Um, so leadership um, overarches the entire process, whether that's leadership by the administration, leadership by the stakeholder community, um, leadership by the SAC. Um, and then the, the big idea areas touch on navigation, access, structure, affordability, and workforce. And within the circle, are the principles and values of the Stakeholder Advisory Committee that we all share and adopted at our, our first meet, in our first meetings. Equity, inclusion, choice, dignity, innovation, and partnership. And what is most important here is in the center of the circle is the consumer, the individual who may need or is using LTSS services surrounded by a circle of support. And it was very important that the circle include family, friends, public, private sector, all of the supports that are needed for the individual. And we want to thank AARP for revising this graphic. Thank you, Nina. Um, and, okay, keep going. Let's see. I think the clicker is, oh, here it is. Okay. So here were the five big ideas that, that we came up with after the last meeting. We are now calling them objectives. We didn't want to call them goals because the, the SAC has goals, four goal areas, which we already heard. Um, so we're going to sit with this slide for a moment. Um, and there's, there's a method to the madness here. Um, this is our, um, everybody's thinking about Super Tuesday tomorrow, but it was Super Monday for the LTSS <laughs> work group. <laughs> um, to deliver this today. And so we really, we, we believe strongly that the first step is how an individual learns about what's available and accesses information and assistance and navigates the system. Secondly, these build off of one another. Um, then how does an individual, family or friends, the circle of support access what is needed once they identify a need, where do they go next? and where do they go next after that and next after that. Um, then once the, the services are identified, how are they paid for? Are they public? Are they private? Is it a combination of public and private? Um, out of pocket costs. We looked a lot at affordability. Then who is delivering those services? Um, how do we build a workforce? a paid and unpaid workforce, a combination of direct care workforce, 
and unpaid family caregivers and people who are deemed family. And then finally, how is our system structured at the local level and the state level, including the federal level, and how do those, um, the state, the local, state, and federal interact and coordinate with one another for the benefit of the individual who needs LTSS services. We're very proud of this report that we pulled together, the funnel that we used, months of input, thousands of comment, um, how we got it down to 30 pages and five big ideas. And I can tell you on a personal note this weekend, I was assisting a family, uh, a local woman at age 51 was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease. And I can tell you in our two hour conversation, we touched on every single one of these objectives. And I, I'm very proud of our work together because I think this really reflects our current system and it sets an aspiration for a future system that will help this woman who just learned on Friday that she has Alzheimer's disease, and she will live that diagnosis out over the course of this master plan. We're going to skip over this and talk. Um, I, I hit on this a little bit. So, um, so the first objective, um, we want this to be understandable, easy to navigate. For those who were on the, on the webinar Wednesday, we, we talked about this. And it's important that the system supports people no matter where they live and no matter what their economic status is. We highlighted some recommendations on the call. You'll see some crossover on our list as we get to it. These were the top level recommendations that emerged um, where there was broad consensus by the subcommittee members and where we saw the most public comment. Objective two, we really do envision California having the most comprehensive LTSS system in the nation. And we would like people to be able to find the services that they need when they need them. And those needs progress, so it's not static. It's not one time. People will move in and out and around the system over many years time. These are the top level recommendations that emerged for the for the um, webinar, and you'll see these on the list when we get to the, to the um, immediate action opportunities. Affordability. Affordability includes both those who are reliant on Medi-Cal and Medicare, as well as those who do not receive public benefits, including VA benefits and SSI. We also um, had some recommendations about how we can equalize our funding streams so that there's as much weight on home and community-based services as there is on institutional care. It's not advancing. See, affordability is really important. We're going to sit here for a minute. <laughs> it definitely, uh, in the comments. Um, so we've talked about a public benefit for the middle class, and you'll see references to the missing middle. It was very important and has come up many times to make sure that, that um, the report not solely be a Medicaid, Medi-Cal document. Mm -hmm. In terms of the workforce, we've received, we've had reports, and it, it's so important. This, and to Judy's point, or I think it was Judy, about where those other issues will go, we, we sort of drew a line that the focus for workforce would be on the direct care workforce, people working in the home, in the community, and in residential settings such as RCFEs and skilled nursing. And we think that another work group will touch more on the professional workforce, physicians, nurses, social workers. Um, and then of course, um, focusing on unpaid caregivers who are the backbone of our long-term care system. And then uh, you might notice that we started with leadership um, and we moved it to objective five because it, it, we, we agree that this supports the system instead of starting with the system. And, and the elements of the local, state, and federal administrative structure, coordination, and financing is key to a successful delivery system.
So thank you for doing a 90-minute webinar in nine minutes. That was impressive. <laughs> that was impressive. I'd like to open it to the SAC for conversations about this, this, this or the graphic, the framework, the five big ideas, the five objectives for discussion. Dr. Torres Gill. Thank you. Excellent report. I listened in on a good part of the uh, webinar, so just uh, wonderfully transparent and clear. Uh, two, two quick comments or questions, and you may or may not be able to address it at this point. Uh, first, under Objective 3, the vision, the goal of uh, creating some kind of a public benefit, the question is, to what extent were you looking at Washington State's uh, relatively new long-term care financing plan. And then I have just one other quick question. We looked very closely at that. <laughs> and we love it, and we think California can go even a step further and be even bolder, more inclusive with, with a public benefit similar to the Washington model. Great, thank you. Let me just say amen, yes. <laughs> uh, but the, the second point on uh, goal number four, and again, certainly we, all recognize it will never, a new system or revised system will never work unless we really improve, expand, compensate that long-term care workforce. But as I looked at the materials and the report, I didn't see any real reference to who comprises either the formal or informal workforce. And in this case, I'm talking about immigration and immigrants and uh, certainly minorities and at the larger level we know with all this anti-immigrant sentiment that's going to also impact the extent to which immigrants whether from the Philippines or Mexico or the Caribbean or Central America that increasingly comprise that workforce uh, I didn't see any reference to how do we adjust, respond, or be aware at least of those larger policy political forces that may shrink what had been a growing immigrant workforce, certainly in California? That's an excellent point. And I think you'll see um, some references to the composition of the current workforce. So we, we touch on it a bit, but that is probably something that we could expand upon. And, and, and we touch a bit on the shrinking workforce and for, we don't call out specifically why that is one of the factors that could drive a shrinking workforce. And I would just suggest it might be a way to uh, coordinate with uh, Regal's group as well, but I think at some point we need to make reference to that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Judy? Hi, Judy Thomas, Coalition for Compassionate Care. Um, I had asked about the graphic because the earlier one had the um, information and assistance on it and that's not referenced here. And information assistance, I guess, is a term of art which may be very narrow, and I was looking at it very broadly, that I think if people don't have information, that's something that we find in caring for people who are seriously ill. There's not enough information given to people about their condition, about the process, what to anticipate, and to start making those plans. And people don't, it's a false choice if you're not given the information because you, you just go down a path and you end up someplace where you may not have ended up there if you didn't, if you had information. It's not about the healthcare, it's the system or the professional, it's about the individual having information and it's empowerment. And so um, I don't really see that maybe it goes under navigation. I know there's some things at the beginning of the report, it talks about the needs, values and preferences will be honored. So I'm not sure if this is more of just a general comment conceptually, uh, but I think that's, a, and that maybe that'll be crosswalked with health that we'll get more into advanced care planning, goals of care conversations. So I'm not really sure where my comment fits totally at this point. So that, thank you, Judy. That absolutely is included under navigation. And we tried to use terms that the public um, might be more familiar with. And we see navigation as a big umbrella under which information and assistance um, is, is the first recommendation and a robust INA system um, in, in multiple settings. Um, and, and that is also something that will be referred to the healthy, healthy living because there's a lot about direct referrals from healthcare settings and, and back and forth there. Nia? 
So looking at the Nina Weiler Harwell AARP, um, don't have a lot to say. Very pleased with the report, but I did want to ask a question about the five objectives. Um, being a very literal person myself, objectives are measurable. <laughs> so um, is that going to tie back directly to the research subcommittee and what they're working on, like all these pieces and how they measure that. So they're, they're, I know they're looking at this and they're going to be made aware, but in terms of allowing them to come up with uh, measurement indicators for each. That's a really good question, Nina. So the research subcommittee, we have four We've met on uh, goal one, and we have four members who are working on dashboard items, core measures, system drivers to recommend to be in the dashboard. Um, whether they line up exactly with the objectives or not are something that's going to be talked about at the March 10th meeting, where there's going to be some cross-pollination between the researchers who are working on LTSS and all of you folks on the LTSS committee. Thank you. Kevin and then Marty. Hi, this is Kevin Prineville with Justice and Aging. Um, I, I just wanted to take a minute to congratulate and, and express appreciation to the group that worked so hard on this, um, mostly, maybe exclusively women who put a lot of time and energy and effort into this. I, I, think, um, I think we have so many pieces of the process moving that and our group tends to get quickly into next level of details, but I think we're at a critical moment to take a break at that part one Kim was referring to and really recognize that I, in my opinion, I think we've captured really uh, well um, in, a, in a compelling narrative, the, the important, what I was calling last time, big ideas here. I think you've done a good job of capturing a lot, but also there has been some prioritization here that has left some things off so that we can really hold up some of what is most important and valuable. Um, so I think that this is fantastic um, and, and really um, important. Um, two areas where I would just say that emphasis is, is really important is this proposal about the LTSS uh, benefit is, is huge. This is like a really, really, really big deal for our community to come at a table like this and put an ambitious idea out there like that. And then hopefully if we can agree on that, start to continue the work that's been ongoing to really move that into implementation. So for those on the phone, there's signs being held up in the room now from wonderful engaged members of the public uh, that say LTSS for all. So I don't want us to move quick, too quickly to the next level of detail before we have some moment to make sure we're all on the same page with this and, and um, join each other in, in pushing for something this ambitious. The other ideas are also very ambitious, and so we should find the ambition in that too. Um, my other comment is just on the equity piece. I think there are a lot of equity tie-ins to the concepts here, and with the equity work group, as Fernando was saying, we can make those more explicit to add even more power um, to the issues. And then finally, just uh, Susan, again, you are really great at this, and I found the nine-minute version more compelling than the 90. I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> when you have to do it in nine, there is a greater sense of the clarity of the ideas and the ambition behind them. So I'd encourage us all to continue to think about the nine-minute versions of these um, and what really resonates for us as a community and not spend as much time in our 90-minute versions. Um, so great job. Thank you. Hard act to follow. Marty Lynch from Lifelong Medical. Hard act to follow going after Kevin. A um, couple of things. So, yes, fantastic job, you guys. Uh, all the SAC and other members who worked on it. A couple of the <laughs> big ideas that jump out for me that I just wanted to give a shout out to were this site. First of all, this affordable. So, that to me is the universal coverage aspect. It's the public benefit aspect to go on top of Medi-Cal and maybe Medicare, but that's an exciting idea in the fact that you said, hey, we looked at Washington and we went further. Really nice. So uh, so I put my shout out and check mark on that one. Right next to the big idea that there be access to LTSS in every community, uh, 
when we know that today the availability of LTSS services is so different community to community. One community I can get PACE, another community I can't get PACE. Uh, you know, there's different levels of adult day health care, other types of services, community to community. And to think about having a system as a goal where that we would have equal access around the state to this range of services of health and LTSS services together, that's a fantastic thing. I had a couple of co brief comments on, oop, on top of that. Um, number one is uh, uh, somebody I think from Archstone called out the Medicare issue at an earlier meeting. And I would just say that we, we put Medicare and the use of Medicare to fund possible LTSS services in a kind of a separate place from where we put the integration discussion for the duels. And we put it, I think, in a separate place from where we put the financing discussion for LTSS as well. And I think uh, there's so many people in the state of California who have Medicare um, and may not be duels that it's important to think how does that integration happen for the Medicare population and how does it happen to help support LTSS. We know Medicare is an acute care benefit, but it's slowly, slowly moving to add some LTSS uh, services. So I would, just, I would just make that comment that if we could find that tie-in somehow, it would be a good thing. And then the last one, because I can't uh, veer away from a little controversy, I, uh, I know that um, you, know, you guys worked hard on IHSS. And there's a section in here that talks about IHSS uh, with support for those who want it or need it, I think. Uh, I, I remember, I forget the number of the thing without glancing through my page again of the objective. But the, there's a comment on that. But I, I was surprised to see in the list of ways that people could get support with their IHSS, I did not see the managed care, the duals managed care plan that they might be a member of. Now I understand there's a lot of political feeling about IHSS and linking it to managed care, so I'm not totally naive that way. But I thought there should be one option for people who want it to link that uh, to their health plan if they desire to do so, not forcing anybody else to do that. Uh, so that was, that was my, my other comment. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Do a minute or two so that we can also um, have some time to pivot. Uh, Rigo, are you in the queue or not? Is that an old queue? Okay. Would you like to be? No. <laughs> uh, the next few, just so you know, um, actually, uh, I'll just do Debbie and Bruce, and then Jenny is on the phone, and Cheryl, Derek, and Jody is the list we have right now. Service, Debbie. Okay. Oh, sorry, Debbie. Hi, Debbie Toth with Choice in Aging. A um, couple of things, and this may be a little bit too deep of a dive to have, but I really want to elevate a couple of things. I want to echo the sentiments of Kevin. I want to double, quadruple, quintuple, whatever we do with those, because um, the people that worked on this are not only incredibly brilliant, soulful people, but they put together something I think we all can get behind, and that's pretty darn exciting considering the different places and spaces that those folks came from. Um, language matters, words matter. And I think when I read this report, um, there's one thing I wanna ask that we think about as a group. We are accustomed to framing things as regardless of rather than in regard to. So regardless of someone's age, what if it's in regard to their age? What if we make it a positive flip of the frame so that we're not pointing out an inability, but rather an ability or an option or an opportunity or something along those lines? So um, there's a couple of places that I've noted it, and I don't know if that's too micro for this conversation, but I feel like it's an important, we have an opportunity to do something different right now, and this is maybe a way that we can do that. Um, I also think that there are places and spaces where we can infuse 
the word integrated or interconnected so that we're, when, we, when we talk about systems that we call that out, that they need to be integrated, that they need to be interconnected. Um, I am so overwhelmed with gratitude for this, this piece of it and that this is our first step and that this step must also then incorporate and infuse into, and as you mentioned earlier, have crosswalks with the other groups so that it becomes one plan and all together. Um, I just think this is phenomenal, and I thank you. You are, there's a, there's a magician that does magic for Susan, <laughs> and I think when you present things, <laughs> it's magic for Susan and for us. Thank you. Uh, Bruce Turnoff, the SCAN Foundation, so I'll go fast for time. I want to pick up on Deb, what Debbie and Karen said, and in, in Debbie and Kevin said in two ways. So I think how and what we say really matters. And we can choose to be in control and highly informing or less so as a SAC, right? That's, there will be a master plan with or without us. And so I, to Kevin's point about being really compelling, and clear that's incredibly important and language matters and if there's anything that's been true as somebody who did not grow up in the aging network um, we love our words that mean nothing to most people um, <laughs> we will spend hours thinking about ltss versus long-term care and like that's incredibly powerful for us but it gets lost in other discussions so i think a compelling discussion like this is incredibly powerful and Kevin's point about what's in it and the idea that things are not in it that doesn't mean they're not important but these are things that need to be done and they're articulated clearly and they're big is really important we shouldn't assume that this is a continually shrinking pie relative to need and thinking about folks who don't qualify for public programs but will have needs and how do we start to fund that and how do we build an in regards to is it, system is really, really important. The one thing that I want to raise as a challenge uh, to you guys, and it's a minor one, but it's a language thing again. So I love the diagram because the circles are about inclusion. It's about all the things that I need to survive. And one of those words, one of those phrases we use all the, all the time because it has currency in our world is no wrong door. But the problem is for most older people, having just recognize the year since my 103 year old adopted grandmother passed her and having been her caregiver for the last 10 years i can tell you that every door is a wrong door like our language does not match our behavior and that we have these siloed systems we have all these yes but systems so i don't have any problem leaving that in but we need to get serious about what that means as opposed to sort of checking the box because we've got the language there i think that kind of accountability becomes super important Thank you. Uh, I want to echo uh, Bruce, I want to echo Marty, and I want to say thanks, Kevin, and I want to say a special thanks to the rest of you who, um, who headed up this um, wonderful document. Thank you, Susan. I wanted to ask the question, and it talks about the public benefit. Have we talked about or do we have some idea of how that's going to look for people who are SSI, who are not SSI and SSP, the people who can't get anything from the government unless they lose everything that they have? Have we looked at how we can tier that so that maybe, so that maybe um, if, they, if they get the services, it could be, it could be um, phased? in any way so we'll come back to that but i know anastasia is here from the department of health care services and the the newsom administration has already committed to an actuarial study that's underway um, looking at some of those very questions and i think maybe in the summer or fall um, we'll know more um, at this point i think everything's being considered yep yep can we go to jenny on the phone Bring her in. Thank you. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to affirm two points. I just wrote that, Marty, uh, your comments uh, relative to uh, the availability of services is something that is part of objective two 
um, but they also have to be there. Just as we've talked about food deserts, you know, there are actually service deserts uh, in within some areas, suburban and certainly rural. So I don't know how that's going to be addressed. Um, I'll segue to a comment that I made at uh, a policy conference in San Francisco is whether or not going back to the healthcare side, whether community benefits that often are uh, provided by hospital health systems, you know, whether that kind of potential linkage could be explored. Um, because I, I think it's not just the process of accessing, it's whether they exist in order to be accessed. And then uh, my final comment is back to objective number four. Um, I, I offered a terminology about direct care since uh, there will be a ger geriatric professional workforce set of recommendations. But probably more importantly, I wanna underscore, Fernando, your comment about who the workforce is. And I don't know whether a asterisk would be put there with a separate paper of, or a separate set of, of content that speaks to where this workforce is coming from both now and in the future, and especially with changes in public policy. Because if the workforce we know to be like several hundred thousand over the course of these next 10, ten years, who's going to fill those jobs? Because even now today, there are shortages. So I, I think the ability to not speak only about the qualifications, but who are they and where are they coming? Fact speakers before we turn to the immediate opportunities, Derek, Jody, and Heather. Yeah, thank you. This is Derek Lamb uh, with ACC Senior Services. I really want to congratulate the LTSS subcommittee for creating this wonderful document. So with the uh, situation that we are facing at U.S. and the rest of uh, the world, COVID-19, I know that uh, we try to build up a stronger workforce and have, you know, quality uh, personnel to deal with, you know, the LTSS. I'm not sure if uh, we have considered the possibility of folding into this scenario into our report so that we are ready to deal with crisis such as COVID-19. So that's my comment. Jody Reed, Cara. Um, this may be a bit nitpicky, but it's a language as well is that I think the intention always was to have this be the master plan on aging and disability. And we often don't say that. Um, and I, in the introduction, we refer to everybody who may be in need of LTSS services. But then as you get into the report a little more, it's really framed by aging. And I think it's really important that we just do a word check <laughs> as we go through this report and just make sure that we're always referring to both the needs of the aging and disability population at any age so that it's not just seen as a disability if you're older, but that it's throughout because it feels a little like we say it at the beginning and then we don't say it again. And I just wanna make sure that we pay attention to that. Um, the other thing is, and uh, this refers to Marty's um, comments, and why I raised the Healthy California Commission, for example, because there is a lot of conversation going on around what should be a comprehensive benefit, that healthcare benefit, that everybody has access to. And part of that conversation does include LTSS for the first time. So although Medicare has been really behind the eight ball, in my opinion, to address that as it also has eliminated vision and dental and all of the other things, I think it's important that we have these cross conversations because as we're looking for financing, um, once we have the actuarial study, I think this is part of another conversation or many conversations that are going on that if we're really going to ultimately look for comprehensive health benefits for everyone, what does that mean? And is LTSS or access to it a part of that? It should be a part of that and not a standalone thing. It's part of our 
overall health. And so how can we reflect that in here, but also make sure that these other task forces are also aware and have the information that you have, we have all been able to deal with. I'd like to ditto the comments everyone's made in, in praise of this work and thank you so much for the incredible um, thinking and clarity around the priorities. I fully endorse them and I'm so excited to see them here. Um, the one thing I would suggest is I look at the graphic and the center is the person that this is supposed to be for. And uh, to the point of building on what Jody said, um, if we can have a statement of vision that relates to what do people experience versus what does the system look like? Because the system look like reminds me of more of a mission. And a vision would be what is a Californian who's aging or disabled look like in a healthy system? a system that's promoting the services and supports that they need. So if we could work a little bit about a vision that's person-centered, and then all of this supports that, I think that that would advance this work. And it would also make it more relevant to people as they read it, who are not system people, system wonks. Okay. Um, we. Uh, we need to pivot to the immediate opportunities, which in many ways is a continuation of this discussion. Uh, and I want, I think that's going to be more than a 20 minute conversation. Rigo and Clay, just put your uh, cards up. Are you okay if we move to immediate or do you want to jump in? I just, I just wanted to, again, also uh, commend the group. I think it did incredible work. And I also want to thank you for meeting with the equity work group and, uh, you know, coming in with so much work already done. And because we came in a little bit later in the process, um, we didn't have the opportunity to meet with you earlier. So it, it, it took, a, I think, significant work to really uh, and be very open-minded to come in and hear what we had to say as a group. I guess what would be important not, uh, for the SAC to hear, and perhaps those who are on the phone who are uh, with part of the equity work group, not part of the SAC, if you could speak to that, con based on the conversation you had with the equity work group, how did the conversation, in, you know, sort of in, use the feedback, how, how was that infused into the latest draft of this report? Uh, it'd be good to kind of hear from your standpoint um, how that's showing up. Excellent question. And all of this is um, the, the work of everyone, so I'm not, it's not me. Um, um, so, to your credit, it was your first gathering of the equity work group and you were all assembling for the first time and you were immediately put on the spot and, and asked, how can you influence the LTSS report <laughs> stat? Um, so it was a, more of a conversation and a round table. And I, I, I believe while we were there and Sarah Steenhausen and Lydia and I um, presented to that group, um, I believe everyone around the table spoke and shared their thinking. Um, much of it was around language, um, making sure that we were using the most current terminology. Um, you know, two things that come to mind, we had um, communities of color throughout the first draft and we changed that language. Um, I don't think you'll see it in this report. Um, we also try to be more explicit about calling out um, not associating with the individual, but talking about racism, equity, um, discrimination, bias. We tried to be more explicit in the opening. Um, and we also tried to weave throughout, we, we had talked with the equity work group, you know, do you have a, an opening statement or do you weave throughout? And then how do we, how do we make sure that every, every person sees themselves in the report without naming every individual and situation that could, could um, occur in California? So we, we tried to do that. Um, so those would be the, I think the, the changes are subtle, but I, I do think they reflect um, the, the input from the equity work group. And again, it wasn't consensus because you were just meeting for the first time. So we really look forward to the next to the equity lens to come in the tool um, so that we can do that work yet again. Okay, uh, I'm gonna pause, thank you Clay, and pivot us to the immediate action and you are gonna see, hopefully, some nimble activity here as we 
Uh, this was um, the last couple of weeks have been great discussions. LTSS subcommittee has been reconvening to pre this is the immediate opportunities conversation. And SAC, Jeannie Parker Martin ran a little bit of an informal straw poll after the webinar. Thank you to those of you who emailed and did some work. Uh, and hot off the presses, last night, uh, we have a, a couple documents from the LTSS subcommittee proposing some immediate opportunities for the SAC to consider. Um, those of you in the room, there's hard copies of two documents, a Word document that defines what action ready or immediate opportunity might mean and lists 22, if I've counted right, and then a Excel grid behind it explaining how they got there. Since these documents were just became available last night, we are projecting them in real time for those of you on Zoom. As always, they will ultimately be posted on our website very shortly, but um, we are hoping, uh, apologies to those of you on the pure phone, but those of you on Zoom can see, and thank you to the amazing team here who's uh, making magic, speaking of magic, happen <laughs> uh, so that people can see it. Um, Susan, uh, we are going to move to public comment in about 15 minutes. So what do you think is the best use of the next 15 minutes? Do you want to walk people through? All right, go. Okay. So this document, and Claire Ramsey gets a lot of credit for this too. Um, so I mentioned earlier about a funnel. You know, we took, this report has about 140 recommendations in it, um, over 30 pages. They are all priorities. Um, if something made it into the report, it's important. It's important to more than just one person. Um, so the funnel here that you're seeing today, um, you know, first we had to finish the report in order to um, condense it and, and to move to a more workable, manageable list. This is about between 30 and 40 recommendations. Um, so it's about a third to a fourth of the total report. And the focus here, these are not priorities. For anyone listening on the phone, we're not, we're not um, leaving behind anything that's not on this one-page document. These are items that we think are poised for immediate action because their uh, term we used was shovel-ready, meaning the work's been done, they're, they're well-positioned, there's a lot of consensus or it's something that needs to get underway now because it's a longer term strategy and we, can't, we need to do some um, upfront work to get things moving. So we developed some criteria um, here. We also really, you know, immediate and ripe for action is the first. We also wanted to make sure that all of the next steps weren't things that were um, organizing government and that real people in California that submitted comments and are on the phone today can't see in their daily lives. So we wanted to balance some administrative work with some real action. Um, we also wanted to balance the needs of people um, from various parts of the state, various income levels, older adults and people with disabilities, um, and items that um, where there was broad consensus among the the work group where we had a list of sticky issues where things that have kind of dogged us for years and uh, um, not, no surprise, the LTS subcommittee couldn't um, reach consensus on those in two months. Um, and then last, that um, wherever possible that these hold up the values of equity. So we, we looked especially for that. So we organized this list um, according to the five big ideas, the objectives, and if you just scan it, you'll see that one of them is, is um, disproportionately large. That's the access issue. And we think that's because that's where the real pain is today, that, that we need to um, catch up on access because, as you've heard already today, um, there are access deserts in our state and, and, and within our communities. So with these, we've, we've laid out, um, there, there is no um, other than um, meeting this criteria and matching them to the big ideas, the objectives that are in the report. Um, these are the ones that we're moving forward for discussion today. Um, we're not proposing that all 30 or 40 of them advance but we wanted to do that, that next step of work for the Stakeholder Advisory Committee so that you could see a condensed list that has had some vetting where there's some, with all of the subcommittees and writing teams, 
these are some things that people worked very hard on, getting the language right, lots of um, meetings between meetings. Um, so they really reflect work that's ready to go. You might see, you might have other ideas of things um, that are ready to go, um, but this is the list we wanted to present to the advisory committee today for discussion. And Jeannie, if you'd like to add, um, add to this, um, the work that you did? Between yes, them. so um, thank you to the LTSS subcommittee. Having read the document word by word, uh, I recognize the incredible amount of work that's been done and the incredible amount of talent that's brought to the table with this subcommittee work, so thank you. Uh, and it, it really has been demonstrated in this body of work. Um, after the webinar last week, we thought it might be helpful to do a bit of a straw poll to see where is the SAC in its thinking about all of these 140 priorities. And some of you had an opportunity, um, about a third of the subcommittee was able to provide some feedback and help give information about where we individually thought those priorities might, uh, those uh, elements might fall. And I think it's important uh, to mimic Susan's comments that these aren't priorities, but rather they're opportunities for rapid implementation and that all 140 of these recommendations are critical to the upholding of the LTSS report as we move forward. So each of them has an incredible amount of weight and an incredible amount of importance to our success going forward. In this very straw pool, poll and in a very unscientific, unvalidated approach, um, <laughs> we did come up with five elements that were somewhat in sync with each other. And again, this isn't validated, it's not scientific, and uh, it doesn't represent the entire stack. So all of these elements that were identified in this straw poll are identified in the action ready items of the LTSS subcommittee work that was uh, just presented by Susan. So I'll just comment on the areas that were very consistent in the uh, one third of the comments that in the in the one third of you who are represented here today. Um, if you look at the document either on the screen or in front of you, I'll identify which of those were in sync with what I believe was presented just now. Um, under the first objective, a system that all Californians can navigate, the, there were two elements of this that were identified by the SAC representatives. Uh, first bullet, no wrong door, and the third bullet, a Medicare, Medicare coordination and integration, uh, especially that focus on an innovation office and a five-year integration plan. Under the second, ac access to LTSS in every community, um, uh, about midway down, again, recognizing that this is the essence of where there are issues, uh, the one that rose to the top was uh, community living in transition, uh, not to say that all of these other items aren't critical but this is rapid implementation. And then the third, uh, affordable LTSS choices, the bullet uh, establish a frame for, framework for the LTS benefit. And I want to just remark that establishing an LTSS benefit while not necessarily uh, executable tomorrow needs to be started today to be executed probably by the midpoint of this 10-year process. So I think that's, uh, that became critical. And then um, the, in the next section, high, highly valued, high quality workforce, uh, every single one of these is, is critical, but supporting paid caregivers with this direct caregiver task force. And I think it's important to note that several of our SAC committees sit or sat on the California Health Workforce Commission and we need to leverage and launch from the work that's already been done, particularly Heather uh, Young as well as Jenny Chen Hansen, and there might be others that I, I don't recall who were very instrumental in that commission. And then finally, um, to create a new focused LTSS unit 
the state and local administrative structure needs to be um, implemented immediately. I also want to make just one other, a uh, couple of other comments if I can, and that is um, there for all of the other work groups, if you scroll to the top of that page, defining these action ready items, this is a very helpful framework um, to think about what should we be thinking about first versus middle versus later on in the process. And I would encourage each of us who are involved in other work groups to consider very, very critically during your discussions, what are the short term, what are the intermediate term, and what are the long term goals, uh, long term uh, implementation items that we need to be considering as a SAC, because that will be critical over time to the success of this uh, master plan for aging. And then the other comment I want to make, make is that reading the report word by word, um, we need to also recognize that throughout the process there will be consistency and inconsistency issues. Um, there will be redundancy and there will be knowledge gaps in the various workforces. So I think it's important to extend the hand to other experts on a particular element to make sure that the language is appropriate and then whoever is the final editor of the entire master plan for aging gets the charge of saying yes this is the terminology that we're going to use throughout so just a couple of other comments for the other work groups thank you okay with that i think we'll do five minutes of that conversation before public comments again we're just in discussion stage Cheryl, are you still up Definitely no, okay. All right. All right. And uh, Nelson, will you keep me posted if anyone on the on the phone? Then we'll start with Bruce and Marty. So this is terrific. I just again want to thank you for your hard work. Just for sake of time, to be really clear, the thing that I'm one, I really feel like we need to move recommendations forward. This is fantastic work. Um, Susan and Jeannie, how would you? I'm trying to square a circle, which is these are a lot of recommendations. They're all really good. I actually, on the face of it, having read the report carefully, can see why they're kind of, they would float to the top because they are likely things we could start now or need to start now. It's a lot. And so I wonder, like a smaller number or easier to move, a big number or harder to move, but they're all really important. And I, I'm sure you guys have given some thought to this. So how... Do you have a recommendation to us about how to move that? Is my concern valid? Is it, are these so important we should move all of them? I, it has no right or wrong answer, but you guys have thought about it more than anybody. <laughs> I'll go first and then the committee can really answer. <laughs> uh, I would say that given the importance, uh, Judy mentioned some comments earlier of the uh, navigation system information that that to me is one of the critical first steps that we need to move forward with. There are, are there are elements here that could be ticked off pretty quickly. If we think of action steps, we could create signage, we could do some things that are very quick to implement. From a broad-based messaging to, to everyone, to all Californians, um, I think we need to have some critical big messages like we are creating a navigation system to move forward and some of these other items we might be able to implement in the first 365 days pretty readily and easily, but the, the bigger message is about moving forward with a navigation system, with moving forward with long-term services and support benefits planning, et cetera. Does that answer your question or not enough? Maybe Susan has a better answer. And I would add, I would add that there's a mix in this list of things that might be a budget item, some that could be done administratively, and some that are legislation. And, and many of them are already in process by advocate groups. Um, I, I would say, I think this is my opinion, but I think they, they stand together. And I think going forward, it would be important to have um, something in each of the five goal area, the objective areas at a minimum um, as we proceed. Marty, and then Clay, uh, and then... Uh, Marty Lynch, uh, Lifelong Medical. Uh, I think <clears throat> a couple things. Uh, this is the follow-up on... I don't think you're on, Marty. Uh, 
How about now? Yeah. Hey, hey, Marty Lynch, Lifelong Medical. Uh, follow up on, on Bruce a little bit and, and uh, Jeannie. I like the process of trying to get down to a fewer number of bullets that you kind of took your feed, your non-scientific feedback and, and went down to a fewer number. Uh, and then I was going to, uh, Bruce earlier said business about the language of a aging, you didn't call it that, but something like that, that we get into. And I took, for example, and hoped that you were going to put your PR people on it, Kim, uh, if you have any. Uh, <laughs> we hope you do. Uh, there's uh, under affordable LTSS, there's establish a framework for LTSS benefit. Now, if I read in the language of the plan, I think what that's about is we want to do a public insurance long-term care benefit in California. I think it's something like that, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. But but I'm I'm looking to see can we come up with those kind of statements and pick out a small number of bold ones. Again, going back to this idea, things that. We hope Governor Newsom would be excited to announce in October or whenever he announces the LTSS stuff. You know, can we do it and do it in a way that would make a newspaper headline or uh, a policy thing that we can all, you know, get behind? So, so that's all. I think again, good work to get this far. Can we get it down even further and bolder? Can I comment on that quickly? Oh, um, I think that as we synthesize these recommendations, those key messaging elements will start to be clarified. Um, and, and even in the straw poll, we, I think we got really good um, messaging opportunities. Um, the other thing I would say is something we need to emphasize as a, or think about as a SAC we have a budget opportunity for some things coming up, and those have to be um, identified if they're not already in the works. We need to identify those that are in the works and make sure that we don't miss an immediate opportunity for budget action in, the, in this fiscal year. Okay, we're going to do Clay, Nina, and Kevin, and then we're going to go to public comments. I'll just, to my team, uh, I'm sorry, there's some, and Mercedes. So we'll do four sec. I'm going to ask you to do a minute, if you can, on a big issue. Go. By Camp Area Agency on Aging in Santa Cruz and San Benito Counties. Um, so I want to echo what everybody said here, and, and I do think we need Mike, fewer. Clay, Mike. Mike. <laughs> All right. Clay Camp uh, Area Agency on Aging in Santa Cruz and San Benito Counties. So I want to echo what the last three folks have, have said. I do think we need to have fewer or, or a smaller list to just make a bigger impact. And I would suggest just what Jeannie was, was hinting at. Look at what's immediate right now and move those to the top of the list. And I do this from, a, a, well, th the perspective is that, for example, ADRC program funding is going to be before the Senate Budget Subcommittee on Health and Human Services on Thursday. So if we could move that top or at least top five, that would make a huge impact on whether or not that project gets funded. And we're talking about some real money in here. So, so I would think that one way to break this down would be look at things like that that are in the immediate queue and put those to the top. And then look at things like maybe long-term service and supports as a benefit, put that in the top queue also, but look at that more towards the June 17th presentation or something that the governors really want to go to roll out in October. So that might be a way to micromanage it, just to make sure that that the true low hanging fruit that's going to fall off the tree if we don't pick it up now, that those are the, the top immediate action items. And then even within this, we still want to emphasize other things, but we don't necessarily have to have action in the next week or month or, or six weeks, whatever. Nina. Like me today. Here we go. <laughs> Nina Weiler Harwell, ARP. So I, I agree with all the comments that have made, made, made previously. Um, really important, again, that at least some of our immediate action items feel tangible to real people in the real world. I do want to raise up in terms of the framework for the LTSS benefits, since I didn't hear, hear it say, we already have a bill, and it's all the way in the second house, SB 512. Um, it's actually in assembly appropriations. So that's a possible way forward, um, and it, it calls for the state treasurer to lead it and so forth. So just food for thought. 
Mercedes on the phone. Can we unmute you? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Mercedes Kerr with Belmont Village. Uh, I just wanted to maybe add a, this has been talked about, so I won't uh, belabor the point, but uh, I totally understand the concept of immediate um, goals and, and in particular those that might be time sensitive, but there are some bold statements here that I think are really very valuable and important to follow through on, and that is maybe a call to action to all of us. You know, I, I'm not sure if some of this work extends well beyond um, what we might have uh, considered this assignment to be, uh, because this is just going to take longer for the people who have collected these ideas and have worked on them to really implement them. But, uh, you know, some of the uh, concepts around benefits and expanding those, those are really worthwhile topics that I think are going to take longer than this assignment might originally have con contemplated. But I think that there's an accountability, at least that I would feel, and I'm sure many of you uh, feel and have expressed already, uh, of following through and making those happen. So I'm just uh, suggesting that there is some sort of concept here as you're considering the timeline of how or when you prioritize these, that there is potentially some sort of tail that sort of follows in this committee and, and the work that we were asked to do to begin with, because just a simple concept of implementing or, or seeing it through is gonna take uh, that much longer. And you know, I, I think many of us would be willing to participate in that. Thank you. Kevin and Catherine, last word before public comment. I guess I, I'm going to be a voice for, um, for not trying to narrow this down more. This conversation is becoming muddled in my mind. I thought at the start we talked about two parts. I thought, Kim, you phrased that well. One part being trying to capture what Marty's talking about, the headlines, the October report, the governor standing out and saying, here's what we're committing to. Part two being what we were talking about just now, this immediate opportunity to get in some budget asks. We haven't talked to the governor about this collective group. We haven't talked to legislators about this collective group. Many of us are working on items within this. I'm much more comfortable uh, going to those legislators and the governor saying, here's where we're headed on the big ideas. Here's a menu of items that we've identified. Some are legislative, some are administrative. Um, now start discussing together. What do you think? <laughs> um, to try to narrow this further, and, and two, in deference to the subcommittee, they would have gotten it more narrowed if they could. I don't see how our group, with less expertise and less time, is going to get to a few. I mean, we could because we tell ourselves it has to be five, so we could force it. But that group was trying to get there. Um, and I think that the SAC is the SAC for the master plan. It's not the coalition pushing budget items for the aging community. We, many of us are doing that work outside of this room. So, so I like that the SAC said, hey, here's a whole menu of things that we're all working on that help advance these big goals that we've coalesced around. And now let's let the process play out. I feel like we're negotiating against ourselves if we try to narrow the list here. Catherine. I will just say ditto that this was really intended to be not a prioritization of the report and that every item in there is important. This was intended to simply say, what might we do now in the budget or in a policy bill on matters that you know, have, we think have some traction? So I'm a fan of also not. We are now going to hear from the wise public for 15 minutes about what they think. Uh, we are then going to break for lunch and refuel. Uh, and then we will come back and have 45 minutes to decide on the action on this report. Okay, so step one, let's hear from the public and I'll ask my team how we're organizing the room. Show of hands. Okay, uh, Marsha, you've got a mic, you want to start over there? So, Hand and Hand is the organization that got me here. Uh, I'm sorry, let me just pause. You're welcome to stay seated and comfortable as you are. Um, Marsha and Ellen, can folks just raise their hands and you can move near them so they know they've been heard and seen. We'll do about 10 minutes in the room and then we'll switch to the phone to see also how it's going. So, sorry, excuse me for interrupting. Please begin again. Uh, hand in Hand is the organization that got me and my I am not a professional mic person. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell the 
Hand in Hand is the organization that got me here. Um, I, I am Sally Amsbury, and I'd like to introduce you to my mother, Shirley Amsbury. She has a master's degree in early childhood education, and in 1948, with her husband, brother, and his brother, bought a house in Richmond, California. She makes $200 a month too much to get any benefits. I, on the other hand, am low income, but there's nothing wrong with me physically, although I do have a diagnosis and am taking medications for depression and anxiety. I'm very happy now. Um, but her other two daughters, her son died and her other two daughters moved out of state, so it's just me. I am there 24-7. Um, I try to get some help at least with cleaning the house. There supposedly is a benefit through her husband's veterans benefit, my late father, from World War II, but we can't, between my sister in Portland and myself, we have messed up the access and don't know how to get there and don't have any help with it. So. It's extremely glacial, and I spend a lot of time zoning out in front of the television, but we're doing what we can, and I'd really love to see some help. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wow. My name is Henny Kelly. I am the Legislative Director for the California Alliance for Tired Americans, CARA the chair of the Democratic Party Disability Caucus, and a retired teacher. I am 78 years old, and I'm not as abled as I was at 24. CARA represents one million seniors in California. We're economically, racially, politically, geographically, religiously diverse. And we represent different sexual orientations and abilities. We are grateful that IHSS and other income-specific LTSS programs are available to our low-income sisters and brothers, although those programs need to be strengthened and expanded. However, for those upper poor, working class, and middle-income seniors like myself, there are little to no LTSS services available, and you just heard about that, uh, that we can afford or access. So many of us wind up spending every last cent we saved, including selling our house to afford these services as we age or as we become disabled. Many wind up unnecessarily in institutions, destitute and forlorn, taken from our communities and families. We urge this impressive group to send a strong, committed message to the governor and his administration that we must make the creation of a universal LTSS benefit the number one priority of his master plan on aging and on disabilities. Even if this group decides to focus first on those recommendations that are easily accomplished this year, it must be very clear that we cannot consider our work a success or a complete plan until there is a pathway for this universal benefit that has a financing plan that is progressive and considers the needs of current seniors and those in the future as well as support for the workforce that we will need to provide this care. Remember, the budget must be completed by June 15. To begin it this year, we need to do this and make clear what is important. I am so happy LTSS is the first thing you're talking about to vote to send the governor a plan without including this would be a disservice to the current and future seniors and the disabled persons in California and to their families. 
Thank you. Thank you. Now, oh, we have one on this side of the room next. Hello, my name is Phyllis Kalbach, and I work with an advocacy group, a nationwide ad advocacy group that works with uh, desperate families and vulnerable families who have been victims of horrendous financial crime. And we also work with legislators, federal and state, and get, getting updating our laws, which some of them are still back in the Middle Ages, into the 21st century. Um, I've also worked with um, Carrie Kasem and traveled with her across the country to get laws and upgrade our laws. And one of the things I love, everything that you guys are doing, especially this gentleman back here, I love what he was saying. One of the things we find working with families who have been victims, they had no place to go. And here, here I'm sitting here looking at all of you folks with all of these resources. And we go to the police, oh, that's terrible, but I can't help you, not my problem, it's not in the laws. Oh, the social service is not my problem, not my pr Meanwhile, the criminals are coming in, smiling all the way, and by the time anybody gets anything done, my father, personally, he ended up 94 years old, thrown in the street in Tennessee, absolutely indigent. Be and we could get no help. So what we need is for all of you guys to get um, a centralized um, organization somehow with the government, with, with, with our governor, where families can go and say, help me, please, because they are so desperate. And what is happening out there is so new to our civilization. So they don't understand, and we live a whole new kind of life. So we need help, but you guys have all the resources. Get together, and so victims have a place to go and help us with the legislators to understand our laws need to be updated. To, and all of this will bring us into the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. Are there others on the phone? Just to be check one second. Are there others on the phone? No, great. Continue in the room. Thank you. Thank you. My name is, is it on? My name is Frances Smith. I'm also a member of the CARA organization. I want to tell you how I started out in the disability world. I was 20 years old. My husband and I were living on the GI Bill. That made us low income. When my baby girl was born, I was sent to the Well Baby Clinic for follow-ups. When she was eight months old, I pointed out to the doctor that she couldn't hold her head up all the time. She'd have her head up and it would fall down. And the doctor then unwrapped the blanket again and looked at her again and said, cerebral damage or obvious cerebral damage. Your child has cerebral palsy. I didn't hear anything else she said. I got my baby up. I went out the door. My mother was waiting for me in the car. I cried all the way home. I cried all weekend. Monday morning, the public health nurse was at my door with information about where I needed to go, how, I, how, 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 how she could be follow up at clinics, crippled children's services. We don't use that name anymore, but crippled children's services paid for everything. I didn't have to find a door. The door came to me, paid for the services, paid for the surgeries, paid for the braces, paid for, yeah. So I got help. We don't do that when somebody gets the diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia, or sometimes people get hit on the highway or a motorcycle accident. We don't do that. Um, I recently retired as the director of a public authority, the second one, I was in Contra Costa County, then I went to Yolo County, and we referred good IHSS providers to people who needed help to stay in their own homes as independently and um, with as much dignity as possible. I also had to take the phone calls from people, and I would have to say, I'm sorry, you make too much money. You don't qualify for this service. We must create a stable funding source now. Oh, by the way, sure. Um, yeah, I made these comments before you talked. I'm, I'm so old now that I can't even remember, and I worked with you for how many years? Anyway, I made these comments before uh, you made your speech, but we have to have a stable funding source for people, not just those with low income, so they'll have services to stay in place. For the services they may need someday, not now, but someday they may need them. We know how many 80-year-olds there are in this state right now, and we know some of them are gonna need this kind of help. So we need to do what we do. We pay 
Every city has more than one fire department, I think, with the fire engines there and the firefighters there and all the equipment they need because someday there'll be a fire they have to go to. Well, we're looking at a population and we know we're going to need to serve them. So get that funding source, that, that stable funding source in place. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm a creek or a stream or a river. <laughs> But I want to be the flood of a storm of people. If we have to sit in the governor's office, we have to do this. Um, I'm not here as a consultant or a decider, but I'm here as a persuader. Please do what you need to do. Hi, my name is Marcia Friedman, and I rec uh, represent a group called Elder Action, which is a social justice a group affiliated with Village Movement California. Uh, I'm here to, I, I think I represent a population that you call the missing middle. I don't really like being thought of as missing, but, but, but I do understand, and yes, we are missing from a public policy point of view on this whole subject of long-term care. Uh, what I am particularly concerned about is, and um, First of all, to celebrate along the rest of you the idea of a public benefit for long-term care that is very long overdue in this country, and I think California can really lead the way uh, in making that possible. But what we're particularly concerned about in my group is that the, cover, that the public benefit will also cover those who are already retired and wouldn't have an opportunity to contribute through a payroll tax to funding that public benefit. And so I urge you to think about the ways in which we who are already retired can pay into the system in order to benefit from it. Hi, I'm Diana Madoshi and I am um, with CARA, but I'm also with, uh, with my church. But see a lot of different some of the concerns, and we see a lot of the gaps among of our seniors. Most of us are aging. And I'm 74, and one of those current people, and I see a lot of current people that wonder what's going to happen to us. So I am in support here of inclusive long-term care and the public universal for long-term care is critical. A lot, there, there are so many gaps in the system. And we laugh, myself, we laugh because I, I say it takes a, vig, a village to get me to A, T, B, and C, and if I get ill, it's very scary. What happens with my lupus, I start having more problems, and I'm not able to uh, manage. So I urge you. Uh, to consider that from what all the speakers have spoke about, from what Henny has said, for Fran has said, and for all of our people in our, in our disability community. The two are hand in hand. I have a disability, but you don't see it. But what I'm saying is that I'm, I also want to say I am so happy and encouraged to see that we are at this point. When I first uh, started with CARA in 2005 or 2006, I never envisioned seeing we will have this. We went through the cuts. We went to the cuts that were from all of the services that has never been replaced. Right. But the fact that you're doing this now is very important. And it's also very important that we try to do it right because the numbers are increasing and the, the best that we do this, and you're off to a good start. So I commend you and say, still remember this. Thank you very much for the work that you're doing, and I'm praying that you will continue to do it and work hard for the benefit of all of us. Thank you. We have two more public comments before the break. Hi, my name is Marissa Shaw, and I'm here as a member of Hand in Hand. I want to give three vignettes 
Um, I have an IHSS worker who's currently dis displaced, even though she has a husband and two kids, they're all displaced. Um, um, she can't make enough to, to earn a decent wage um, on IHSS. Now that might be a common story, so they can't afford a, a, a current rent in, in the Bay Area. That might be a, a frequent story, but the reason why I'm saying it is because on IHSS, um, well, I just want to say that basically, um, as waging as w the wage increases in California, whatever this benefit looks like for LTSS, um, at, you know, uh, I would like to see that that um, em em employees get a decent, I mean, a living wage at the same at the same time that there's no cuts to consumers who need the service, whatever that looks like. Um, the the second vignette that I want to talk about is I have a friend who uh, I have two friends I have more than two friends but I specifically <laughs> I specifically know of several people two two friends in in particular uh, one is um, 62 and is no longer working because of lupus um, and she also makes too much money to qualify for IHSS, um, and her health is suffering because she can't get enough attendant care, and she's currently paying out of pocket at an enormous rate, even though she has insurance for her durable medical equipment. She's still paying 20% um, <clears throat> at least, and so um, so it's really difficult to afford um, services and your durable medical equipment expenses and, well, you know, the story, but I just, you know, there, I guess she would be called the missing middle too, which, um, so, and I have a, a second friend who actually is paying into the system and works over 40 hours a week. And um, we all know the Bay Area story, that rents are so high in the Bay Area that even when you're trying to make it, it's really incredibly hard to make it. And so um, um, my other friend has cerebral palsy and even though she's working full time, she can't afford the services of attendant care. So um, we all know the missing middle story and here in the Bay Area, as I'm sure in other places, but here in the Bay Area, people with disabilities and seniors are really feeling the crunch. They're really feeling the pain. And so um, I commend, uh, the committees that have created this and yeah the missing middle really need to be recognized and but also those on IHSS it's uh, this is now a current uh, problem in California if you guys can help even a bit it would help uh, take some pain out of just surviving in the bay with, with a disability or as a senior or as we all age in place thanks a lot Hello, my name is Connie Hubbard. The last comment before lunch. We have more public comment at the end of the meeting as well, but I'll give you the last word. Thank you. My name is Connie Hibbard. I live in Richmond, California with my sister Sally at Atchison Village. I am a local to Unite Here union member. I have been on the picket line for three months fighting for health care. I retired with health care. After health care, I have Medicare, and then the whole simply drops out from under you. We are the fifth largest economy in the world and we are the 50th in standard of living. And this is why the middle is dropping out and it's making all of us suffer. I'm really hoping that we can move forward. We will bring union members to sit in on those meetings if we have to. We will fight for this. Aging and disabled, we will fight for this. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for, for, for being here with us. Uh, all of the metaphors about creeks and streams and rivers are very much inspired for me by Dr. King, right? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. So thank you all for being part of that mighty stream. A conversation will continue over lunch. We'll come back 
We're going to aim for uh, 1245 and do our best. Um, I want to also give a shout out to our wonderful partner, Plates Cafe and Catering is providing food to us today. So thank you in advance for all of your work to bring it to feed us and nurture us. Marsha, instructions for SAC? Yes, so lunch is provided for committee members. If you can form two lines to get through quickly and start with the tree wall end of the line, please. See you in 20 minutes.
moment, I'm going to call on Catherine to get us started again, but I'm going to give her the courtesy of a quiet room. So. Thank you. Dina. Well, we enjoy we enjoy road trips together and Dana. the catch up and take little breaks. And okay. Driving, so it'll be a pleasant. We have had a robust discussion and a chance for a really powerful public comment and a lunch break to refuel. And now we are back with a 45-minute block of time to turn to action. And. Um, I had asked some of our, what we're calling duels, our people who are on both LTSS and SAC, the duels, uh, if uh, he, having heard all that feedback this morning uh, and been part of all the conversations, if uh, you could kind of summarize where we are and make a proposal for SAC action to at least start the conversation. And it looks like Catherine was willing to take the reins. Perfect, thank you. I, I actually wanted to just add my appreciation for all the members of the public on the phone and yes. in the room. I thought those were really phenomenal comments and really important, so thank you for that. Um, and as well, all the robust uh, SAC comments. So from um, listening to that, I, I think there's two pieces of a recommendation I would like us to consider, so I'll put that out and then I'm sure we'll have a robust discussion about it as well. Um, the first is that um, we will incorporate all the good feedback we've heard today into the LTSS report. I thought there was a lot of wisdom about language and the importance of immigrant, uh, particularly immigrant workers, that we need to um, make sure that we read through the report and um, adopt all of those um, really good suggestions. I would ask that we get any other written comments by Wednesday so that we can keep this moving. Um, the LTS, LTTS subcommittee will um, be meeting on March 10th, and they will see a revised report that incorporates the feedback that has been received. And then LTSS will um, loop back to the Equity Committee at its meeting on March 17th and explain how we, what we've done to incorporate it and provide, L, um, provide the Equity Subcommittee sort of a chance for fatal flaws. There's something that we really got wrong or uh, something else, and we'll also send it out to SAC um, so that they can do the same thing, like look at the report as it's been finalized after today. If there's something seriously wrong, then it's a fatal flaw and you should let us know because none of us want to be embarrassed by saying something that has a big uh, problem. So that's the first part of that. Then after the 17th, the uh, um, the report will then, because we will have given all of you a chance to give, do fatal flaws, uh, will then become finalized and ready for getting in its you know, final kind of best looking approach. And then the second piece is I, as you could tell from my endorsing Kevin's comment, am uh, in favor of sending a transmittal letter to the governor with the um, action ready items as they're listed in the longer form today and not shortening that. I think we have a real opportunity and kind of don't want to bid against ourselves in terms of what we put forward and what we're collectively or individually able to move. So those are the two pieces of my thinking. Uh, any of the duels want to elaborate or add any context or clarification? Okay, then Maya. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I want to support um, Catherine's ideas. Um, I think for, um, I support what, what Kevin said so eloquently. Um, you know, there, at first blush, I thought we should have a few ideas because that always is more powerful. But um, having participated in both exercises, so when uh, Jeannie, I submitted five ideas, and actually after listening to this, this uh, yeah, I think so. After listening to the discussion of our LCSS committee, we had a phone call late Friday. You know, through the benefit of discussion, 
I probably would change my mind on some of them because there are always things you don't think of. So that's what the flaw of doing these kind of polls, is just what's at the top of your mind at the moment. And frankly, we don't have the opportunity to really have the kind of in-depth discussion. Um, you know, maybe the LCSS committee could have gotten to fewer if we'd had more time. We have the time that we have, and we did the best we could. So um, I think um, the idea of putting forward this as is, as a menu of options available to policymakers is a, is a good idea. Thanks. Bruce. And then Debbie. Um, Bruce Chernopoulos, Camp Foundation. So I, I want to just second what Maya said because I actually think, Kevin, your argument was pretty persuasive and I too sort of started out with the sort of less is more strategy. But I think um, one of the things you said that I think is really important is that this is a master plan for aging for all Californians. Okay. And it's not about any one organization's current legislative agenda and I actually think going in with a broader list of there, there's so many opportunities. We, Kim, you lead a department that lives in a world of opportunities. And so I think actually having a rich list is not a bad thing. The one observation I would make, and it was something that you said, Susan, which I actually agree with, is these things are not all the same size and shape, and they're moving on slightly different tracks, right? So some of them are, frankly, budget asks. Some of them are pieces of legislation that need that shining a bright light on them actually in commenting to the governor, we'd like to see this move and no, we don't want to see this turn into a two year bill from a one year bill, that kind of stuff. And then some of these are things that probably agencies could do under current authority and they're just not happening as quickly or as robustly as we as a group think. So I think in the cover letter sort of recognizing that this is a there are different vehicles for accomplishing these, but as a whole, they're all really important. And that just signals to the governor and his team that we recognize that this is not about, not every one of these is a budget item out of the blocks. So, but I, I would support the proposal. I need the microphone. Thank you. <laughs> Debbie Toth with Choice and Aging. Um, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead to pull this um, chart out. I don't know what graph chart that the LTSS subcommittee did um, for the objective, um, the different objectives, and it categorizes whether they're an administrative action, a budget action, a legislative action, an infrastructure action, and aligns with GOV's priority action. And it's, um, it's a chart, and it outlines all of those things. And um, I'm going to pause there and say, I support what Kevin said. I support what Maya said. Um, I definitely would like to move this forward in this structure with perhaps some edits post this conversation today. 100% um, in support of that. Um, but I'm wondering, I'm sitting here, I'm listening to what Clay said, and I'm like, yes, 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 but no. Um, yes, 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 we want to take advantage of the opportunity for the things like the ADC, ADRC bill that's that's there. Um, there is a CCT bill being carried by Senator Dodd and a budget ask that we just got a champion for. So Dodd and Nazarian, Assemblymember Nazarian and Senator Dodd are champions for a budget ask for the California Community Transitions Project. Um, and there are other bills in circulation and budget asks happening right now that fall in line with what we see on this paper that's in that LTSS report. And how do we as a committee stamp support for those things that are happening, what do we do so that we can capitalize on all of this right now and do the report as a whole? How does that look? I'd just like to say the way that you do that is to write a letter and have everyone sign it because they're going to be making those decisions in the next short while and you can't wait. So write your letter, tell them what you want. But can I continue on that for just a second? So that was Cheryl Brown um, from the Commission on Aging responding to Debbie Toth. I've got the microphone again oh, from sorry. Choice and Aging. No, 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 that's perfect. I just want to orient people to who's talking for the people who are on the phone. Um, so 
in addition to which there are opportunities happening, which I brought this and I'm going to pass it around. There are two transportation bills and Clay and I were the webinar Wednesday transportation SAC members um, that are assembly and Senate bills that do not include accessible transportation for the aging population or people with disabilities. And we need to be able to hop into those and say, what the secretary said at our very first SAC meeting, which is there has to be a lens for aging and disability on everything we do. And so I did do your letter, Cheryl. I'm so proud of myself. Um, but I think that there's got to be a way we can formally, as a committee, work together to ensure that these priorities that we've identified in the LTSS report get passed in this cycle. I'll stop. Donna Benton. Um, Hello. There. Okay. Donna Benton. Um, I endorse the longer version. I really think that's good. I also want to go back to something that Debbie said way earlier, which is wherever we can, if we can do this in a more strength-based presentation, in addition, to, instead of just always kind of have less, 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 or uh, negative. I think that that might also involve more, um, that has that equity lens that we discuss about where in the community do we have these strengths. And so um, if we can add that into here, that would be great. Thanks. Hi, Nina Weil Harwell, AARP. <clears throat> so Kevin, thank you for having said that before lunch because that was for me at least the answer, and I'm glad that we settled on the list. Um, I'm just really just seconding Debbie's idea about how we show our support for these initiatives. And I'd also, um, you know, anything we can do to show up, um, because it's not just about writing letters, that would be important as well. Um, but just thank you everybody for the collaborative thinking. Thank you. I'm, I'm also in support of the full list. I think it's been so well thought out and it's long, long standing. It's, it goes far into the future, different sizes and, and shapes of the different recommendations. So I would say we should go with the full list. The spreadsheet, I think, is really a good one and it might be useful to add a column that shows immediate action or the criteria that were used for the um, proposed action or maybe a place to say it links to certain bills or or action so that it, it really maps it nicely for someone at a glance to see now I could do something about this and it also calls out who might be responsible which I think gets at some of our uh, issues around wanting measurement and accountability with the ideas. Jody Reed, Cara, I like that idea. I think for all of us we're here individually, but we also represent organizations. And so that tool that identifies where we can take immediate action and where would be very useful for us to kind of push out. And having said that, two things come to mind. One is, in addition to the LTSS actionable items that are immediate, in all of our goal areas, there are things that are happening. And so I just wonder if there is a way to, in between meetings, for those of us who may be working, for example, there's a big activity, there's a big budget hearing this week and next, and many of the issues that we're talking about here and in other um, goal areas are going to be talked about. How do we connect one another to the things that we know are going on. I don't know if there's an easy way to do that, but it would be really helpful because some of us are following more closely certain things that we could get, we would love to have support from the rest of us on, and I think we would probably easily get that are pretty immediate. Um, some are budget asked, some are legislation, and so I like this tool, and I'm just wondering how we like push it out into some of the other areas because the time is now. Back to the LTSS report, um, based on what we heard today, I like the idea of the big picture, the whole list. 
I, I just think it would be good if we're going to send it forward that we frame it with our original goal, our original vision, which is, I think, I hope, to be able to develop an LTSS universal benefit that everyone has access to and that supports a well-paid-for, well-trained workforce that um, is equitably financed. So that we state that from the beginning, that's our goal. These are steps towards meeting that goal, but that that's always at the top of our thinking. So that and in anything we transmit to each other, to the governor, to the administration, that's at the top of the list. That that's what all this is geared towards, because I think we have to always be finding a place for everybody in here. Hi, Clay Kemp, uh, Area, Agency, Area Agency on Aging of Santa Cruz and San Benito Counties. So since I was arguing before for the, the smaller list being more effective, I think I'll, I'll get to really uh, hopefully a win-win on that because my reason for that was I just want us to have wins. I want us to accomplish things. So, you know, that was my strategy for saying let's just have uh, a smaller list so we can prioritize things. But I think what we're describing here kind of spells that out. If we can look at the chart that has the different categories that things fall into, we can hopefully, if we're adopting this list, we can cite our position on anything that's included in here if we're talking to a budget committee or a ledge committee or whoever. So this would allow us a way to go forward as long as we have specific endorsements as a group. Um, I do think there's a little bit of concern I have in that process because this is a fabulous document, but it's incredibly complex. So there's things that I think are putting the cart before the horse. And for example, I want to call out goal 1A4, develop statewide quality standards for information and assistance services, et cetera. I completely agree with that goal. But if we have an INA system that does not have adequate resources or support to do that, we're going to be counterproductive by putting additional regulations on an underfunded service. So I think we need to be strategic in that. And maybe we could do that just by tweaking the language or the goal a little bit by saying establish support for this or resources for as a piece of it. I don't want to wordsmith. I think that's the worst thing we can do in this group. But some sort of thought needs to go into, are we really going to help ourselves by adding regulations to services that are inadequate, not because of quality or effort, but because of just lack of the ability to do what we all hope happens. So I'm not sure how we do that, but I think part of this process needs to be looking at each of these goals and make sure we're in a position to achieve them and actually have a better outcome. So with Kevin's comments, proof again that this is an iterative process, that we're, we're, we're considering something that we hadn't been considering at the start of the meeting. And I, I'm in full agreement. You persuaded me to move away from a short list. And with our legislative session, we're already at the midpoint, the budget. You know, this is, this is a document that can serve as a planning tool for next session because soon people will already be starting to, to do work. And it also can take us through the governor's full four years by having a longer list. It also gives us room for the other goal areas to do their work and, and there might be further um, congealing is the word I'm thinking of, but it's not right. But there might be things on this at the end of the day that, that get bundled with the other goal areas and they're really propelled forward in the October report. So we're not preceding that work. We're allowing that to unfold. Oh, no, I'm afraid of Marty. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Uh, Marty Lynch, Lifelong Medical Care. Um, uh, I'm uh, convinced by my colleagues that it's worth forwarding the longer list, but, or and, I'm also in favor of this idea that's come forward of a framing letter that might simplify 
the message. Uh, and I haven't given up on my idea that Kim has amazingly talented PR staff who can, <laughs> who can work on some of the language in the list to make it a little bit more understandable. So uh, I would just say that. And then I, I have a little bit of discomfort, which is I assume all of us will be the great advocates that we are and take action on specific bills. And of course, if this group puts out a message that says these things are all on our list, we'll use that to say, yeah, yeah. And by the way, we're advocating for this and it's on the, this, it's in this planning process, you know, this master plan process. Uh, I'm hesitant to have anything that suggests that the master plan group is taking a stance on particular legislation unless we get there at the end of our planning process and right. say, this is really right. the priority item or two or three or four or five that we want to hang our collective hat on. So. I was a little nervous about the, the stance point of view, although I certainly expect all of us individually to take stances with our organizations. Thank you. Well, I certainly support uh, Kevin and Marty. I know better not to go against them, but um, so certainly I think, uh, you know, wouldn't want to shorten the list. Um, but at the risk of everybody else, I think there's one item that I just have to call out that I think would, in my mind, an estimation would be important to add to the list, which is 1A5, which is conducting marketing campaign using easily understood messaging in language and culture. Again, because of the populations that are underrepresented, often left behind, if they're not connected and they don't, you know, what's the point of knowing how to access something they don't even know what to access? So I think this has to be something that has to be on, on that list. From, so I would strongly encourage that we consider that addition to the list. Yes, Mercedes, uh, um, hi, this is, yeah, Mercedes Kerr with Belmont Village. I uh, wanted to ask, and I'm sorry because maybe we're just a little bit of a disadvantage to those of us who couldn't make it in person today. Um, the references that are on, I, I took screenshots of the uh, the, the proposed action ready item sort of list, and I do think that a comprehensive, uh, I guess, list of all of the different uh, areas of opportunity is, is fair to submit, and I'm not sure as well, but um, the references made there, I don't know if they are the same references, and maybe something can be put up on the, on the screen for those of us who are remote. Uh, to see that there was a comment earlier in this section uh, of uh, comments about maybe some sort of um, spreadsheet or grid that was indicating kind of what, uh, at least in our estimation, were the next uh, sort of action steps for some of these types of initiatives. Um, and, and perhaps, oh, there we go, maybe it already exists, but I, I think that that would be a, to really create some sort of full vision of what uh, this this team has worked on for so for so long and so hard to really provide uh, at least a, a recommendation of a roadmap for some of this would be very uh, important um, so that it's not kind of good idea but nobody really picked up that ball and, and kept walking with it you know as we had intended or, or the committee had intended. Peter, thank you Mercedes and thank you Nelson oh, wait, for quickly. We, we, I forgot Rigo. No Rigo? Oh, okay. Okay. Peter and then Jeannie, I believe, are the CPU. And I'll do my best to see where you are. Peter. <laughs> I know. Where you got? Okay. Okay. Um, so Peter Hansel, CalPace. I want to add my uh, voice to the voices supporting moving ahead with the full list. Um, I didn't quite agree with Marty where he started, but I think I agree with him where he ended up. <laughs> so I think he got it right. Uh, there is a sense of urgency that this will be out uh, in a public forum, and I think we can all use it um, as a reference point. I do think it's important to memorialize all these great ideas and create uh, kind of a something etched in stone that people can use uh, over time. And this will take time, I think, to get this done. There is a role for the uh, stack in terms of taking positions or tracking specific things. I'd, I'd want to have more discussion about that. Yes, Jeannie Parker-Martin from Leading Age California. Um, 
I agree with uh, the comments that have been made in terms of keeping the list whole as you proposed it. I also would recommend uh, as uh, that we might want to reorder some of these items because sometimes even though we think they're all important, uh, a level of uh, discrete opportunities in a way that maybe guides others would be helpful. And then as my daughter always say, let's not get ahead of ourselves when I ask her about certain things she's up to. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering, I was wondering about the pro, well, you'll get it. I was wondering about the process here. Um, we're sort of assuming that the governor is going to accept everything carte blanche and that the cabinet accepts everything carte blanche. And um, is that an accurate assumption, number one? And number two, is this being accepted in March, or is this part of the master plan for aging that will be accepted and presented in October? So just a couple of clarifying questions. Okay, seeing no, oh, Don, are you back up? Yeah. Oh, great, one more, and then I'll try to summarize and see where we are. <clears throat> I just wanted to um, endorse Rigo's suggestion. Hmm. Okay. So let me take a crack at what a, a synthesis and um, starting where Catherine uh, began. Well, at a minute, let me just say one, one logistical thing. CDA will post the Word doc and the Excel doc with our agency as soon as we can. So for those of you who are not zooming in in real time or in the room with us, those documents will be available, we hope, within 24 hours, if not same day. Check. Okay. Then I think the proposal that's being um, suggested here is that the LTSS subcommittee take all the feedback that was given today to two things, really, to the report itself, as well as I'll use your language transmittal letter. Some of the big things that came up around the report are the language around disability, uh, having a strength-based frame, the importance of the immigrant workforce to our direct care workforce and what's happening right now with immigration. The word universal has come up a lot around the public benefit, I have to say. Uh, and information as being maybe even a prerequisite to navigation. You can't even navigate until you have the info. So those, and that doesn't meant to be exclusive or comprehensive or, or any wordsmithing, but some of the things that I've heard as um, please, incur please think about that for the report and the letter um, Marty wants you to get a good PR firm to help you with the language, some suggestions about the ordering, um, and this, the grid. People really like the grid and say go, for, go more, go further in terms of mapping. So uh, Rico's comment was about possibly adding info even further in, into that list. So a lot of substantive feedback that would go to the LTSS subcommittee. Uh, and again, written feedback would be dead, is the deadline for, is there for everyone of Wednesday COB. So this is the last input today and Wednesday. And then LTSS meets on the 10th to digest it all, pull it all together into a new final final. Uh, and then the week, the following week, it would go back out for, to loop back to both SAC and the equity work group back over email, it sounds like, equity work group in person, the March 17th meeting, for really a fatal flaw at that point. Um, is there anything in here that's wrong, really wrong? And then the goal would be to finish that loop, and then the week of the 23rd, it would be transmitted to the administration, to your point, Jeannie, and received. Separately, there's a request for more communication and coordination around live action bills and budgets, and many people are saying, yes, I'm interested in that, and I would encourage you all to connect and figure out how you do that, but that not necessarily be a formal SAC activity. I'm seeing nods in the room. Mercedes, I can't see if you're nodding or not, but I'm hearing nods. Can we, yes, sure. I just want to ask the question. Can we make sure, you know, we, we heard the, um, the middle, what was it, the middle? Oh, the missing middle? The missing middle. middle. Can, can we include that some kind of way in, in what we're talking about in the document? I really like 
I like that information. I mean, I like that term and I had it written down for something else, but it was that term that really grabbed me. So thank you advocates. Other uh, extensions or additions to that proposal? Clay and then Jeannie. Clay Camp. Maya? Now I am. Clay Camp, uh, AAA of Santa Cruz, San Benito counties. So I I'm not disagreeing with any of that, but I think it's two steps. I think we should agree on the priorities and put that forward and then agree on the whole report. I think they're just two distinct things and from a process point of view, I'd say let's do one and then the other just to make sure we're clear on what our action is. And I think there will be agreement on both, but I, you know, for, for me there's, and I'll do it now since I have the mic, there's an additional piece of the report that literally I just thought of today when we're talking about access and one of the challenges that I've been grappling with, and I think a lot of us have heard as a challenge, is services in rural communities and how they're lacking. And just last week I was talking with somebody about how does someone in a rural community get their home fixed or how do they get to a place when they live where there's no transit. And the best answer, and it's very hit or miss, is a volunteer or a neighbor takes me. What's unfortunate is that in those rural communities, there's typically no organized volunteer services. They're just randomly that you find them. And in a richer community, and Santa Cruz is one of them, there's a very healthy, vibrant volunteer center. But in San Benito County, the other area that I serve, where volunteers are just desperately needed, there's absolutely no infrastructure to organize that or have somebody get a call if they need a ride, for example. So I would just encourage that to the LTSS report to add, probably under objective two, some component about providing critical volunteer services or having an organization that can, you know, make that happen or bring it all together or coordinate it. And I actually have a suggestion. If we look at Older Californians Act, in regulation, there is a volunteer component to that. It's never been funded, but that would be a nice thing to put in place to make sure it's all across the state. And it's one place where I think a baseline allocation is really critical given just the nature of how the rural services are probably more critical than the urban ones and population-based won't get us anywhere. Yes, um, I wanna echo what Clay just said. And also uh, to back to the comment about the uh, middle, uh, the forgotten middle, middle, middle. The, <laughs> the missing middle, the, the forgotten middle is actually uh, a study that was done by the National Investment Center and uh, the, at NORC at the uh, University of California, uh, I'm sorry, the University of Chicago, and they presented at one of the meetings uh, of the LTSS, I think early on, and on Tuesday, February 10th, from 11.30 to 12.30, Bob Kramer, who was the former CEO of NIC and now is sort of a ex temporary you know, he's like the immediate past CEO, he's going to be speaking at Leading Age California's uh, second Tuesday webinar. So if anybody's interested in hearing a little bit more about the Forgotten Middle, Bob will be speaking in a webinar, um, and you can just email me and I'll make sure you get the link. One of our webinars? No, it's not. Not to confuse you. No, it's the leading age Wednesday. California. I probably am not supposed to give a, a you know, message More about that, merrier. but I just wanted More to talk merrier. about the forgotten middle, and it'll be heavily integrated into the housing recommendations because it's such a critical element of of the work that we need to do in California. But you said February 10th. I'm sorry, I meant March 10th. <laughs> okay. I did say February, t whatever the Tuesday is, second Tuesday of March. I was so confused. Sorry. Okay, any other? Um... Comments? Uh, have we charged the LTS subcommittee? Do you feel clear? Do we want to vote? Do we want to ask if there's any block to the consensus? This is your practice round. Mm -hmm. I could take a vote if you make sure if you want to. Hey, I'm in. Uh, you want to vote? Okay. Do you want two votes? One on the report, one on the. Well, yes, okay. Um, I'll try to be a parliamentarian then. I, uh, I guess someone else I'd can like count. Oh, Cheryl. I'd like to move. Oh, here we go. We're getting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Use yeah. the mic. Yes, Ms. Brown. Yes. Take your Please. microphone. Take oh. your microphone. I'm sorry, I forgot that. I'd like to move that we hardly accept the report from the LTSS committee and give them commendations and move it forward to the next step. There a second. Second. Dr. Uh, Trinette Torres-Gill, I heard you first, although you were, you, there was great competition for that honor. Okay, let's take a vote on the motion to accept the report. All those in favor, say, uh, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Thank you, Mercedes. Aye. Can you put the participant thing up so I can see who's there? All those opposed, say, what do you say? No? Nay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> That's next. That's I next. like those kind of. Oh. Uh, anybody uh, abstaining? Okay. So we have a unanimous oh, vote yeah. to accept the report. <laughs> Do we have a motion on the immediate action document? I move approval of the immediate action list with the consideration of one addition as raised by Rigo um, related to the um, language campaign. A second. second. There, once again, is it Derek? Okay. Uh, second honors are given to Derek Lamb. And I hope, can oh. someone on my team be recording this so we got it for uh, posterity? Okay. A second. So, all right. So let's take a vote on the motion to accept the uh, LTSS subcommittee proposed action ready item document. Can we have a short discussion? We can. Sorry. Sorry. Hello, is this on? Yeah. Is it possible to offer a friendly amendment that this ready for action proposal has a statement at the beginning about our intention with this so that, because it kind of gets lost here. Yeah. And so since this is a shorter document than the big report, I just feel like we need to say what our ultimate goal is. Susan, do you want to friendly amend your motion? I, do it. Really, I, I think it's going to be really important too at some point to remind folks there are these lengthy recommendations behind this all that go into great substance yeah. so making sure you call that out and where people can find out. So the frame up top, the lengthy recommendations behind other direction. Okay. With that direction, I'm going to call the question. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, all those in favor of the LTSS subcommittee proposed action ready item list moving forward as amended. Say, uh, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All those abstaining? All right. Our second unanimous vote of the LTSS. Well, you, this is uh, an incredible body of work, and you have set a very high bar to follow for all the work groups that are about to tell you what they're up to next, <laughs> who are feeling uh, only the best kind of pressure uh, for the example of um, excellent analysis, excellent collaboration, commitment to the process as well as the product. So thanks to all of you for uh, paving the way for all of us and our work together in the coming weeks, months, and next 10 years. Okay. 1.30, let's turn to a um, invigorating whirlwind updates. Uh, all of your peers have about five or 10 minutes to tell you what's happening with their work group or subcommittee. And we're gonna kick it off with our equity work group uh, and our co-leads, Rigo Saborio from St. Barnabas and Kevin Prindabil from Justice and Aging who will tell us about the work group and the equity tool that they are developing. All right, well, thank you so much for this opportunity to give you an update on the work of the equity work group. And as uh, Kevin and I discussed, he's given me permission to go first. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so on February 13th, uh, we met together as a first time as an equity work group. Uh, as you know, uh, 50, well, about 50% is comprised of members of the SAC and another 50% of folks that have been identified and selected across uh, the state uh, with an expertise in, uh, in working through the equity lens through their work and life experience. 
and it was I have to say it was a very energized robust conversation uh, people were really appreciative with the fact that we have brought this group together and, and even though it wasn't in terms of ideal right at the beginning of the process the timing still worked out and is very much you know, appreciated by the group but at that said there's also an expectation that whatever what does get discussed and what does get recommended there is an expectation that it will transcend the work of the other work groups and the work of SAC so um, I think it was very pleased uh, you know to hear obviously Susan uh, commented on you know follow up on our conversation of the work group because when we did meet obviously we had a long-term uh, LTSS work group come in and give us an update and gave us the opportunity to provide feedback as a group uh, and that was a, an amazing uh, process and Susan uh, obviously mentioned identified the work going back and how it was integrated and there's more work as Catherine pointed out it will be coming back uh, so that was good but anyway um, so we all came together we reviewed our purpose again and that you know part of that is uh, to um, evaluate the recommendations, uh, also uh, evaluate the sort of the implementation and the follow-up evaluation of the master plan. So that's a, a purpose. We talked about uh, how we best do that, and Kevin's going to be touching on the equity tool. So we discussed ideas for the equity tool, but we also, you know, had a very good conversation around language to be used. Uh, Susan pointed out that was part of it, you know, talking about, you know, it's not, you know, people of color or communities of color, uh, but rather, you know, racially, ethnically diverse communities are defined in a different way, being respectful, being and acknowledging uh, these the communities. Um, and so, again, I think a lot of great work was the foundation was laid out, and uh, we're looking forward to really being uh, continuing to be part of that process. And... Kevin, if you'd like to talk about the equity work group and sort of next steps. Yeah, and so as Rigo said, the work group is, is I think we really pulled together a wonderful group of people, including many of you that are here today. Um, and we're being staffed very ably and capably by uh, a lot of the team, including Carmen Gibbs is our main go-to, so thank you, Carmen. Um, uh, and some of the takeaways that the work group is working on next are the development of this equity tool um, it's really a list of questions that we hope will be useful in the next work groups to, um, to walk through these questions to ensure that they're thinking about the key equity issues uh, that the work group is focused on. Um, and we hope that the tool will be helpful to those groups both as they're outlining their full set of recommendations and then also it's a tool that can help you look at particular recommendations. And then we hope it's something that may be helpful and useful to CDA as it evolves and the CDA um, is doing its work and as we're thinking about implementation of the master plan as well. Um, and maybe there's, you know, so as we build that tool, we're drawing on the expertise of the committee members. And then we're also looking at models that other governments have used, other advocacy organizations have used. So we're trying to learn as much as possible um, in what we build. And it makes me think we need to be looking at whether there's other agencies in the cabinet that have equity tools that they use. And to Debbie's point earlier, we need to find ways to integrate aging into the tools that are being used by agencies that aren't otherwise focused on aging. Um, the work group is also um, going to be getting engaged in the webinar Wednesdays, so we've really encouraged them to attend those meetings, to promote those meetings to their networks, and then also we're modeling um, engagement of the work group on the other work groups similar to how we've used the SAC in the work group process. So we're identifying liaisons from the equity work group to liaise, liaise, liaise <laughs> to, um, to each of the work groups so that we're really creating that um, interconnectedness um, that was talked about earlier, um, how these all issues all fit together. And crosswalk, I think was the word. Um, I think that's everything. Are we missing anything, Kim or Carmen? I was going to ask the same of the other members of SAC who are part of the group, if, if Donna Benton, Catherine Blakemore, Cheryl Brown, Leandra Clark Harvey, Derek Lamb, or Berenice Nunez Constant, or Marty Lynch wanted to add anything. I love working with them. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> they are fantastic to work with and to 
and I've had to do all of mine on uh, on telephone, but I hope that we'll be able to meet face to face uh, this next time. I think that one of the big things that we were able to do, first of all, is to uh, include so many other people in the state of California. And the way that we went about that was to have people um, go online and apply. And I forget how many applications we got, but it was mind boggling. It was really, really, uh, it's something that people want to talk about. Another thing people want to talk about is, you know, everybody now wants to say communities of color. <laughs> we dispelled that because people don't really like that. It doesn't say who you are. So um, to your point, I think that was right on target, and I'm so happy. Thank you very much for the opportunity to work with you. Leandra Clark Harvey, um, thank you. I think we have amazing leadership in that group, and I'm just also thankful for the flexibility to just create it because we said we need to do this, and so um, you didn't have to do that. You could have pushed back, but there was openness to doing it, and I think it's very useful. I think we had a test case in the meeting of a document coming to the group and us reviewing it, even though we had all just met, um, <laughs> and I think that there was a lot of flexibility and openness to the folks that presented, and we were able to make some meaningful changes in real time. I know that the hallmark of a good meeting is when people want to stay longer, and we had met half a day, and folks were like, I want to be here longer. Can we do this for two or three hours more next time? Which, wow. Um, so I just think that's testament to how um, great a group is assembled there. Thank you. Other comments? Uh, I just want to thank also the leadership team, both Rigo and Kevin and Carmen Gibbs on our CDA legal team, and then also one of our applicants, our members, Carmelita Tercy, who's a former AARP, who said, sure, I'll facilitate with you all. So we have a shared leadership model, uh, really um, stone soup, putting it together uh, and finding the time and finding um, the creativity to do it. Um, the next meeting, uh, if I can do it by, by, by memory, is Mark, it's St. Patrick's Day, I can remember that. But the, what's coming before the group is both the LTSS report back is it the research subcommittee? Yes. It's the research subcommittee talking about the data dashboard and the overall approach of person-centered objectives and strategic drivers and the equity lens looking at everything from <clears throat> geography but also race and ethnic and particularly SOGI, sexual orientation, gender identity. We're trying to track that down too. So lots of data-rich discussion coming. Oh, and then, we're, of course, we're going to talk together about the June 17th statewide event, how to make sure that's as inclusive as possible. That's my memory at the moment of what's on the March 17th agenda. Do you have the full time and all that information? We do. It is 10 to 3, and it is, is, are we hosting? It's at CDA. Anything else, Carmen, that we should? Come to the mic. <laughs> you do the report. <laughs> We're just working to get the Wi-Fi. <laughs> That's our 10-year vision is that we'll have Wi-Fi. No, no. It's <laughs> we are, we're on our way. We're on our way. <laughs> Baby step. Baby can I step. just... Can Anything I, else? Yes, on? I wanted to say one more thing. Yep. This past Saturday, I happened to um, be able to go to a Seventh-day Adventist church. And... As I talked about the master plan, I talked about it, and these were all really young people. And I was trying to explain to them, you know, you're young now, but it's not going to be very long before you will. In 20 years, you're going to be this, at this place. I think that we have to make sure that this plan is there for them and that they can buy into it because they're the caregivers for their parents. And they are the ones that are getting older. So we just, you know, this the aging is not aging is not just getting old. It's starting from birth all the way up. And I won't say to death, but I'll say it's mm -hmm. birth. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the case, then this plan needs to reflect that. Okay. We will transition to our next uh, body of work that is now underway. So in February, we, uh, we uh, 
recruited leads for each of our other goal areas. We apologize that goal one had taken all of the attention uh, and that we uh, turned to goal two, goal three, goal four. Next slide, please. And we recruited captains from SEC. One more slide. Uh, and uh, gave them a charge of beginning to convene. And they will uh, tell you where they are with their work group and what their current thinking is about their product and anything else they'd like to, maybe perhaps reflection on the webinar Wednesdays that have also happened. So with any luck, I got my goals right on these slides. Oh, good. Goal two, livable communities and purpose. We're so grateful that Nina Weiler Harwell from AARP and Jenny Chin Hansen from many places and many titles uh, agreed to be at the co-captains. And Nina and Jenny, could you give us an update? I'll have Nina go first. Happy to share the update. This is, again, Nina Weiler Harwell with ARP. So on Friday, we had our first convening uh, by conference call. And um, the members of our team, in, in addition to Jenny and myself, include Leandra, um, I'm forgetting people now, Stacy Moore, who's with the research subcommittee. Um, why am I blanking on everybody? We had several people from SAC on the team, Jen, um, Jeannie Parker-Martin. What we did is, so the idea that I brought to this work group was to use, to organize the Area 2 report around the domains within the network of age-friendly states and communities. And there's eight domains. It's very flexible. It could be more. It could be less. A lot of times it's more. Um, and that idea was accepted by the group. And with that, um, assignments were actually made within the domains. So I had already spoken to most people. Deb, of course, was on. The, I'm sorry, Deb, Clay. I had already checked in with most of the people just to ask them how they felt about being a, a sub-lead within the Area 2 report. Um, based on their expertise, whether they did a webinar Wednesday, and so forth. Um, we had some discussion around how we'd organize this. There's several areas like respect, inclusion, um, civic participation that kind of all go together. So folks did um, either agree to or sorted themselves among the eight domains. Our next step is to get the recommendations um, that have come in to see them, as well as public comments, which will then be filtered out to the subcategory leads uh, for review and summarization, just like we did with LTSS. So we have what we've agreed. As I, I gave a timeline on the slides on Friday, which obviously is now going to be truncated <laughs> since our due date is May 1st. Um, but either way, give or take, <laughs> um, I did try to sketch out a timeline, kind of a work plan for us to do the work when summaries would be due, editing. Um, we hadn't really determined who would be on the larger editing and writing team yet. We hadn't gotten to that. Who would, um, which members of the team would write the executive summary and the big ideas and so forth. But that's what we've sketched out so far with uh, potential every other Friday meet, check in meetings if needed. Um, if there's a need for clarity or if we need to come to agreement on uh, an area that, a, a challenging area. So that's as far as we got on Friday. And the only um, cross pollination I would add is that research subcommittee took up livable communities and purpose at their February meeting. Mm -hmm last week at Stanford, led very much by Stacey Moore. Mm -hmm. And you are on, do on the docket for the equity committee in April to have a dialogue around livable communities. So we'll continue to practice and mm -hmm. make it clearer these, these bridges. Um, but that's a wonderful update. Any yeah. questions for our livable communities and purpose? And I, I would like to add one more yeah, thing is that I realized that I did not include an equity frame so we have several members on our work group that are with the equity work group, and I was, I'll ask them to you, help us with using the tool to make sure that that, that frame is um, top of mind. Mm -hmm. uh, Jenny, do you want to add anything? Um, I, I just wanted to, to add, like, 
Le Leandra is a part of our group as well as, of course, Laura Karstensen, uh, who has done so much with the uh, webinar Wednesday. Um, one, one perhaps concrete example uh, that uh, just happened today that was intentional, but it worked out well. Um, you brought up, um, Kim, about the cross-generational work. And so I spent some time today speaking with Mark Friedman uh, about this. And it just turns out that, um, as Kim and, and her team know, uh, there was a meeting last Wednesday uh, uh, between uh, really focused on early childhood plan uh, that the governor has done. So there's a, a, a parallel effort going on relative to children. And so this cross-linking uh, they were actually quite interested, apparently, according to Mark. And so this, some of the work that could be connected to this livable community purpose and engagement um, may have some opportunity because there were about, my understanding, about 13 or 15 foundations that came together uh, down in Southern California. Uh, another group, um, is, another meeting is going to happen in Northern California about some of the interest in this manner. So bottom line is um, it's another kind of cross link uh, to think about having health um, between uh, older populations as well as, as uh, children. Dr. Benton. Donna Benton, I just wanted to, um, could you kind of elaborate on the purpose side of the livable communities, like what you're looking at under purpose? And um, second point, are you looking at like age-friendly universities when you're discussing this? So that's a great question. Um, we, we do right now, we haven't seen the purpose recommendations come in um, or any of the age-friendly other than I've seen parks and open spaces. So. I don't know what we're looking at and what might need to be included that hasn't been included. Uh, my recommend, our recommendation to the work group was to first take in the feedback and reflect on that before we kind of determined how each sec, how we kind of pull that all together because we want that to drive uh, the report. Um, so how purpose will show up, we have some great people that will be examining that. And age-friendly universities, if there's a recommendation that's come in, absolutely. Definitely. That would fall in there under purpose, intergenerational, or we'd have to figure that out. Is it too late for all the recommendations? No. No, no. So I think it was April, the deadline for recommendations for age-friendly is well, we, this is what, first to discuss with captains, but we had suggested it would be no, no later than April 22nd in terms of the last webinar. We want to make sure we're open, but recognizing people are beginning to gather in right now, so we're open to discussing that with the captains about what is really the last functional time for big policy written. Okay. Thank you. Other questions for livable communities and purpose? And, and I'll just say from the, the staff level, the, the attempt was to make sure we're doing both the built environment and the social environment. And so while there's three Wednesday webinars about the built environment, housing, transportation, and parks, there's three about the social environment at the highest level in terms of the isolation one that Dr. Clark Harvey just did last week, uh, civic and social engagement, which Jenny Chin Hansen will be doing in part featuring volunteerism and intergenerational connections. And the very last one on leadership, which I don't think Rigo knows that he's doing. <laughs> FYI. Can I comment? <laughs> you don't want to. <laughs> Let's move on quickly to goal three. <laughs> no, Debbie, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. when you have to split a microphone between the two most talkative people in the group. Um, I'm Debbie Toth with Choice in Aging. Um, I just wanted to say we, we have received actually a lot of recommendations, and I don't know how many of the groups have, but if you've prevent, presented on a webinar Wednesday, then you've received all of that information up front, and you tailored your presentation based on the feedback that we've gotten from the public. So I bring this up because it's important, too, for um, stakeholders 
uh, to understand that we are receiving their input, whether it's through the website, whether it's through this today's meeting, which was so, I, my heart is just so happy to have all these advocates show up and speak, but there is a process going on by which we are receiving information and we are building what we're building around that. So I think a number of our groups do have some of that and there are some that are still waiting, so just wanted to add that. Thank, Thank you, you. For, for that clarification and the shout out to Jennifer Wong and her team, who ha her team being basically her, uh, but Jennifer and uh, <laughs> all of us who are trying to help. Uh, if you have presented the webinar, you absolutely have gotten those recommendations and where we are now is getting the whole bucket to everyone on the work group and that is taking us just a minute, but it is a top priority. Uh, get to do that, but that's right. Thank you for that transparency. And thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> okay, are we ready to move to our next work group? Which this time I think I have right. Goal three, work group, health and well-being, which uh, has three co-captains, uh, Marty Lynch, Maya Altman, and Dr. Fernando Torres-Gill. Uh, yeah, Marty here. I'll just start on the uh, overview and then we'll pass it around a little bit. Um, by the way, I got to tell you the hardest job so far that we have is finding a time when the three of us <laughs> can, <laughs> can meet, but we just gave Jen, who's going to be working with us, a time for our next meeting. Um, well, we've... Uh, what we've done so far essentially is identified three priority areas uh, for our work group and there, who knows, there may be more coming still because we haven't met a lot yet. We're just really getting started. Uh, but the three priorities are essentially healthy aging and Fernando will talk a little bit about the work he's done on that in a minute. Um, integration in the healthcare arena and Maya will talk about that in a minute and uh, myself and Maya have agreed to work on that as well. And then we have geriatric professional workforce issues and where I know Jenny's on the phone, Heather's sitting to my right, we're starting to get help from Heather and Jenny. Of course, Heather was uh, on the, uh, the workforce, the State Workforce Commission, I forget the, the official name of it, and, and she headed up the geriatric or the elderly focused uh, subcommittee uh, on that group. So she's starting to pass us some information and Jenny from her AGS days as well. So we're hoping that they're going to be willing to help us shape what we do at this, at this uh, MPA level uh, on geriatric workforce. Uh, so that's essentially the, the way we've started to approach it. Uh, but we really are just starting to dig in. So we welcome other folks if, if there are other folks who want to join us in that effort. We have a small group so far and, uh, you know, we'll be looking for others. And the next meeting we just scheduled is for next Thursday, week from Thursday, the 12th at 10 a.m. And, uh, Jen will be eventually getting something out on that when she settles with us about exactly what we're up to on that meeting. So let's, uh, so, so exciting work to do and we have a pretty broad range between the health care and the workforce and the healthy aging side. Uh, Fernando has to go last, I think he, because he actually has done something. I, no, <laughs> Maya's done a lot. <laughs> but, but, but Maya, you want to talk a little bit about the integration side and other comments? So, um, under the, this is a very broad um, uh, section under this goal, and it's, and we're, we're taking, what we're looking at is the broad spectrum of services, and they're not just health services, because we are taking this theme of integration. So somebody mentioned earlier today that we're bring, again bringing back LTSS, and thanks to Debbie, who was very strong about this on our last call. <laughs> um, home and community-based services and the interaction with health is going to again be front and center. But we're talking about things like not just medical services, but behavioral health, oral health, um, uh, palliative care, chronic care. Um, there are probably others. There'll be vision, right? And um, and we really do want to approach these in, a, in as integrated a way as possible. We also, just a reminder, we have the referred recommendations from the LTSS um, sub, subcommittee, so we'll be looking at those. And, um, um, you know, I, I did notice that health was the second highest 
<laughs> grouping under housing of, of recommendations from the public. So um, we're looking, and as, as Marty said, um, Fernando has actually done something, and he had a, uh, <laughs> in this area, he had a webinar Wednesday on um, uh, healthy aging, and uh, we were really looking at this as covering preventative care as well. So why don't you talk a little bit about that webinar? My first reaction was going to be, I have? <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did, we are. <laughs> Anyways, uh, it's uh, a wonderful team and, and Marty has been our fearless leader and Maya just brings tremendous expertise so I'm most happy to join and be, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the, the co-captains. Uh, the healthy aging in some respects is going to almost be a thematic overlay to uh, our area uh, because it does include clearly programmatic issues, uh, it includes a problems and challenges. It certainly will include things that can be done through the legislative process. But it is ultimately, I think, in, in the end, this preamble, this overarching thing is the responsibility we all have in terms of how we begin to practice and begin to operationalize what it means to live a long lifespan in a way that we can maximize the healthy aspects and in some sense, not to be as dependent as we may need to be on our long-term care services and supports and other things. So I'm just thinking out loud, uh, I may put their first uh, preamble with some big challenges and big ideas, and then how these things overarch much of what we're gonna talk about. Certainly we have a little bit of a head start through the webinar, and it was wonderful to meet Jennifer in person and uh, the great <laughs> things she's done. And so we'll be bringing in uh, many of those ideas. Certainly we'll go back through the public comments to make sure that we're bringing in what the public has to say, the advocates have to say, and what they're going to do with us. We will need to dovetail closely with the equity group because there are tremendous cultural and linguistics as well as economic and immigrant disparities in uh, terms of how we're going to promote healthy aging in this society. And uh, looking forward to especially Jody working closely with your group and others, Healthy California, so that we can build off the work that they're doing. And uh, I think lastly, uh, I may be stepping ahead of myself, but going back to the earlier comments on intergenerational, I think there has to be kind of a lifespan longevity piece to this. Clearly, we can do much to promote healthy aging among all Californians at any age, but we also need to think through carefully how we begin to educate and re-socialize younger populations so they can begin that process earlier. So there will be a lifespan longevity uh, piece to it and certainly working closely with uh, Jenny on the intergenerational. So as you can see, we're a little bit, I'm a little bit all over the map, but it will all come together. As a good professor, I'm bringing in some students to work with us. <laughs> and one of them, wave your hand, Ms. Lei Chen, oh, wow. uh, will be working with us. She's a doctoral student at UCLA. And Donna, I've already identified a student at USC in the gerontology program. So we're going to be bipartisan and <laughs> have both universities represented. I understand there's at least a bunch of other good universities in Northern California, but we'll, we'll see if we can find anybody on this side of the state. So anyways, we're looking forward to working with you all. Uh, just one question. Um, that just reminded me, the interface with the research committee you had suggested we have somebody from the research committee on the group, but we don't. Na we have plenty of people from the equity group, but we don't have anybody. Is there somebody assigned, or because yes. there is? Okay. So we will um, we'll circle back to that. The research list. You want to quickly answer that, Carrie or Terry? Because we have a research subcommittee update coming. I was going to do the crosswalk also and say the next. Uh, research subcommittee meeting March 19th hosted at West Health in La Jolla is focused on health and well-being indicators and I wanted to give Shelly a chance to mention the tour that we're all invited oh. to of the ED. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Uh, so par I'm, I'm on the um, health group as well, so very excited to be part of the trifecta at the other end of the table. Um, this is Shelley Lightford from West Health, the Gary and Mary West Foundation, and we're delighted to host the research group on um, March 19th, Thursday. In the morning, everyone is invited uh, to come to our institute in La Jolla, and we'll have a bus that will take the whole group uh, to UC San Diego Health, where we will tour the very first state-of-the-art geriatric emergency department wow. uh, west of the Mississippi. We're very, very proud to um, uh, invite all of you and to learn a little bit about how we're integrating healthcare in the ED in San Diego. Gosh, could I just add, Shelly, I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm going to fly back from D.C. that day, so I'd love to be there. So, but the other thing I got to mention, uh, Kim, because it's a source of trouble, is uh, on the call, on the health call, I got myself in trouble because I mixed up the grad students from UCLA and USC, and I heard this, like, you know, this pause when I did it. I was like, oops, I think that, I think that was the wrong thing to do. But, but anyhow, we're on to health. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Any other health and well-being questions or comments? And again, the crosswalk with equity will be at the April meeting, which is, as, uh, as actually Andrea Hart, uh, Clark Harvey mentioned, is a full day meeting so that we can do all this goal two, goal three, goal four discussion uh, in April. Okay, and now goal four, economic security and safety featuring Kevin Prindeville and TBA. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me go last out of these groups here, Kim. Um, it's gonna become very clear right now that to the extent we've had success in the equity work group, it's because of Rigo's leadership, um, because we've done very little for uh, goal four in the economic security group. There's, I think, three broad issues that this group is covering and that we're looking for some assistance from other SAC members with. So one is um, the, like the poverty area, so poverty, homelessness, hunger. Another is retirement security that maybe gets beyond the poverty issues but to those middle class savings issues. Um, and, oh, there's four. <laughs> and then um, uh, elder abuse, so the safety issues, and then disaster preparedness, emergency preparedness. Um, so the way we've been talking so far is that um, that I and the team of Justice and Aging and, and uh, working with people I will be recruiting here will cover the poverty issues and some of the retirement security issues, but we're looking for help on the SAC to help with the elder abuse issues and emergency preparedness. And we've been reaching out to people. I don't know if we have anything confirmed yet, Kim. We have invitations out on both an uh, elder abuse leader and a... Um uh, dis uh, disaster leader, but neither have been confirmed. And stay tuned. Hope to have hope to have that confirmed this week. Yeah, but we had a wonderful uh, webinar on uh, poverty and homelessness that Janie was the SAC representative for, and was fantastic. Just laid out a, a comprehensive suite of detailed recommendations on addressing homelessness at a variety of, of angles and level, uh, levels. We've got an elder abuse webinar coming up this week and retirement security, I think, in two weeks. And is there one scheduled for, maybe I'm getting out ahead of my, uh, over my security is coming a little bit later. Okay. And then emergency disaster preparedness already happened as well with um, oh, Anna Ockton and Christina Mills. Great, team. thank you, Christina. Um, and so you all are giving me great ideas about how we need to start getting our group meeting and activated. <laughs> and so we will carry that forward. And you, similarly, you'll be at the Equity in April, and your research meeting is in April at USC, is that correct? Goal four, hosted by, yes, I want to say it correctly because I now know this is a minefield. <laughs> yeah, you're at School of Gerontology. School of Gerontology, that's right, at USC. So thank you to all our research partners for hosting uh, the research subcommittee as they go on the road and these crosswalks between the the uh, goal work groups crossing over to equity and crossing over to research. Um, and as my colleague Carrie always reminds me, both ways, both uh, bi-directional. So any questions for any of our goal two, three, four? We'll move to research next. Yes, Judy and Janie. Or Janie and Judy, I'm not sure. <laughs> Hi, Judy Thomas, Coalition for Compassionate Care. I'm just wondering with this last group, so issues of like ageism or ability uh, Billyism, like where does that fall? Does that go into group four or does that go into equity? 
it's currently under goal two and kind of livable, it's one of the domains, I believe. Livable communities include an inclusion and anti-ageism, but this is also something that may be cross-cutting throughout that every single goal will want to address. I don't know if the goal captains have thought about that. Uh, yes, sorry, work opportunity, working longer for purpose and income reasons. It's sorry, Kevin, it's in goal four, and it's already happened, and Eric was our webinar presenter on that. But to speak to this question, Judy's question about ageism, are the captains thinking about goal two, three, or four, where that might, it obviously has cross-cutting impacts. So again, Nina Weiler, Harwell ARP, um, under the inclusion frame, inclusion civic participation frame of age friendly, it would fall under there, but I can definitely see it falling under area four in terms of work, age discrimination, and so forth. And and certainly, I really see, I think we tried to call that out of the LTSS report a little bit. We talked about um, the longevity economy and the idea of changing the way we think about older Californians, and not just assuming that everyone ages the same way, that everyone needs, um, there's just a spectrum of aging. It's really a big picture idea that at some point should show up in the larger report. Yeah, that's why I'm wondering, maybe there's a piece in the equity work group in addition <coughs> to the tool, just some another um, framing to review things under. Him. Yeah, I mean, the very, yes, at, this, at the beginning of the meeting, you may remember this, this slide that I, of cross-cutting themes that we're seeing, um, equity, including ageism, uh, dementia, intergenerational, and so whether there's a, this is something we've been talking about in a couple different contexts, whether there's another recommendation that comes in or whether it's asking each goal to address those themes or both and, I think is something we're still thinking through and welcome advice on. Yes. Hi. So, thank you for allowing me to be a part of the webinar. It was it was it was wonderful. But I'm just curious whether anyone else thinks that goal number four is really stacked. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot. Jokes aside, just to do poverty, homelessness, and hunger, and and the middle class is big enough for us to attempt to do elder abuse and emergency preparedness in that same work group. I just um, like us to consider what that really looks like. I mean, elder abuse is huge. And so can we have a little conversation about what that is? We absolutely can. Thank you. Um, we agree. And this really was meant to just be a way to frame the work. We are very much focused, and Kevin, you can, that we need an elder abuse leader to really lead okay. that work. And I'll be super candid that um, we are a little shallow in that area on the SEC, although many of you do that work as part of your mission. It, um, so it's been a little challenging to find, um, but we think we, we're, but we're on it. Um, and so I think that will be a good question for Kevin, you and, if, and that co-captain to think about, do you really want to work as one or as two halves? Um, and there's pros and cons to that in yeah. terms of separating and connecting, but I think that's a fair point. For, I don't know, Kevin, if you have a reaction to it on the spot. It does feel like a lot. Thank you for recognizing that. <laughs> I think what Livable Communities is doing, we can learn from too, because there as well, you have um, d distinct areas yeah, that fit huge. together, but you need different expertise to tackle each of them. So I think we can learn from each other in our process. I'll also add, so the eight domains actually include health and work, which obviously goes somewhere else. So it's a very flexible framework. And we can, and emergency preparedness is one of the domains that San Diego, I believe, picked. Yes. Yeah. Right. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Okay. So, we so have superheroes. In we have superheroes as our co-captains. We should have called them that, <laughs> co-superheroes. Uh, and they are very much, if I can speak for all of them, are recruiting mm -hmm. people from the SAC, colleagues from their organization, students to try to live up to uh, the bar again set by LTSS of a comprehensive recommendation <coughs> package. Uh, again, with the discretion of what it looks like and how you're doing it to bring to the SAC in May. Well, and I think too that um, we're gonna be driven by the areas where we have specific recommendations to move forward. So whereas the LTSS committee really did a wonderful job of diagnosing and addressing, like first calling out all the issues and then moving to recommendations, I think our work and maybe the other work groups too, will be led a little bit more by where we're hearing 
actionable recommendations. That's where I think we'll put more work in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So more to come on this. Uh, Debbie, sorry, I'm having a blind spot. That's okay. Um, I sat in your blind spot because I'm so talkative. Um, Debbie Toth from Choice and Aging, and I've now beat Cheryl Brown. Um, I'm going back to the ageism conversation, and I feel incredibly strongly about ageism being infused into everything because we are in the situation we're in today because of ageism. That is the cause of the current crisis. So not infusing it in everything to me is problematic. So I'm just going to state. Um, I also, just as a side note on elder abuse, uh, talked to Noah Starr at Treasurer Fiona Ma's office, and his mother works at a department at USC and is training judges on how to prosecute and better handle el elder abuse. And she may be somebody that can be pulled in as an expert, just putting it out there. Jeannie. Yeah, I want to echo uh, Deborah's comments that ageism and ableism should rise to the issue of the equity work group. Yeah. Rigo, response. <laughs> I think we could bring. I, I think we can bring that to the group for a discussion. I think what you know, it, maybe hesitant isn't the word because ageism needs to be infused across all things. But you know, when we think about the space of aging and you think about underrepresented communities, you know, it's not so much the ageism, it's, it's about just disparities among yeah. all these other communities that we are addressing, LGBTQ, you know, you know diverse ethnically and culturally diverse communities, you know, folks with language, uh, you, know, um, you know, challenges. So there's a lot there that we want to make sure that as we're having the discussion and developing the plan, that goes beyond what I think the other work groups are doing in turn, and that it really can address the ageism. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't, and we will. But I just want to make sure, I wanted to have the opportunity to draw that distinction. So if not there, if the work is too already, no, I know you didn't say no, but if the work is uh, already distributed enough, then ageism should, in fact, as ableism, be at a, a very kind of foundational level across the board. And I, I don't know the right way to address it now. There's lots of materials on ageism, and so I think we could probably integrate it um, with some ease as we move forward. And I think we, sorry, Derek, please. Derek. Derek, Derek Lamb with ACCC in the Services. I just want to urge this uh, work group on economic security and safety since we are dealing with emergency. I'll circle back to what I mentioned before, the COVID-19. We need to be prepared. Now we have over 100 cases in U.S. and over 90,000 throughout the world. So. Is it Nina or Judy? or Judy? Nina and Judy? Again, thank you, Nina Wilo Harwell, ARP. Um, just kind of building on the conversation we've been having on ageism, equity, just something I, I want us to consider as part of the conversations is that so-called middle-class individuals, it, there is an assumption that they have the resources and the time to either pay for long-term care, take care of their parents, all of that. Um, sometimes this is called, I'm going to throw it out, the greedy user. The average individual in California, average per, older Californian only gets $50,000 a year, which is barely anything to live on. So um, just being mindful as we're having these conversations that there, there are so many assumptions that have been made about so-called middle-class individuals that are completely off base, especially with the cost of living uh, rising and has, has it as it has been. I mean, California is just not livable for most people within their means. So again, just taking that into consideration. Judy. Yeah, Judy Thomas again. Judy Thomas. Hello. There. Yeah, it takes a while. Um, so I think maybe what I'm feeling like with this ageism issue, issue is, you know, it does 
relevant to all the goals. But there is this overarching piece that if we don't look at it separately, I'm not sure we're going to think of some of the things that could be done. And maybe it's a communications campaign. Maybe it's a PR campaign. Um, it's something I talked to you, Kim, about. Kind of, I think of it as aging literacy. Like, does everybody from a young kid to the oldest senior know what aging looks like? What are the milestones? What are the steps? What does disability look like? How do you take action? So that we're, we're just become smarter about this thing that's a big part of life. Susan. In the LTSS work group, there were several recommendations about statewide campaigns and public awareness, and, and we were under the presumption that that was to follow. So this is a really good conversation. In my mind, I thought one of the um, end results of the master plan for aging would be similar to what Judy described looking at what we heard from San Francisco, the beautiful campaign out of San Francisco. And so this is a really good conversation because I don't know where that would fit, if, if it fits in one goal area or it's at the SAC. And we can take that back in terms of, uh, I mean, I, I do think it's both and. I think there's some leadership specifically around that coming out of livable communities, because livable communities are fighting ageism and are including all of us as we age and are educating us across generations and making, that's what a social, a social livable community looks like. And I think it's the responsibility of every goal. So I think we need to now think about, uh, I was just sidebarring with Susan, so how are you going to check that dementias have been included in every single, she's like, oh, I'm going to check. <laughs> Uh, you know, and there's other issues like that. What equity work group is looking. I think technology, David's going to be helping make sure that we are um, always pushing the technology and not just going with what we know. So I think it's thing we can take back and think about, and I'll ask my ad hoc process group to think about what's the process or deliverable or conversation that needs to happen to make sure we are making those connections. Right now we're kind of getting every vertical going, but then there's the mm -hmm. essential overarching connective that we need to think about how we build that intentionally. Cheryl? I just okay. wanted to say a comment of, that Judy brought up. The whole thing is to normalize aging yes. in California. And so I think that what you're saying is right on spot. But um, to me, it's normalizing for those young children what aging is as they age, and as their parents age, and as their grandparents age. Thank you. Ooh, okay. <laughs> oh, that dropped. Your name's Peg. Oh. <gasps> no, that is not. Hello. Really. Just give it a second. It has like a time lag. No? Yeah. <laughs> this is Jody Reed from CARA. Um, just to kind of follow, circle back to all of this, I was remembering the first Prior to us all meeting and being appointed, I remember the meeting that was held in the basement of the Capitol that um, West Foundation and SCAN um, provided for us. And I, I think it's like circling back to the what got us here, that we are all, the one thing that is we all have in common is that we're all going to age. And looking at some of the research and the polling information about um, a growing sensibility about the importance of addressing age and that kind of commonality and willingness of the public at every age to recognize the need to address the challenges as we age and as we may um, w with ability or disability. And so I think, I do think it's a partly a framing issue, um, instead of just sticking it in, and I don't mean that in a, you know, just like a haphazard way for every goal, I really think it's what brought us here, is that we recognize that our state is aging, we all are aging, and we've ignored the challenges that that brings for a lot of years, and now we're trying to open everybody's eyes to the reality both in terms of not, you know, trying to create a blueprint for how we do this, how we all age more independently, more gracefully, more healthily, if that's a word. I don't know if healthily is a word. <laughs> um, but, but that, you know, kind of recognize and pull out the fact that if we don't have a growing acceptance and understanding and awareness of this, we need to get there 
and we need to get there fast because we're an aging state. Um, and we have, we don't have the resources and the policy, um, in place yet. And that's partly what brought us here. So I think it's, I think it's the preamble in some ways to our work and not just something that needs to be part of every work group. So. We are, like I mentioned at the next SAC meeting, we asked uh, SCAN to come back and present their work analyzing other state plans, and I even asked some other countries uh, while you're at it. Um, but maybe that's another place we could have this framing, come back to that framing work you all have done. So um, all good feedback for us to take back. We have a, a robust research subcommittee update to give from our consultant Terry Shaw and a pretty brief Together We Engage planning group update to give. So let's do those two. Uh, Terry, Research Subcommittee. Am I on? Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm Terry Shaw. Um, and I've had the uh, good fortune to be working with the Research Subcommittee quite a bit. Um, and I just want to reinforce some of what we've already heard about what the Research Subcommittee is up to, which is um, the research committee, like every other committee, is having a series of meetings, and those meetings are um, all organized around the goals. So we had in January, we had goal one, uh, February, goal two, March, so March 19th, as you've heard, we'll be doing goal three, and in April, we'll be doing goal four. So we are focusing on those um, goal areas at every meeting. And we have um, a great set of research subcommittee members, some of whom are also here in this room. Um, and you can see on this slide, I think a question came up earlier about are there research subcommittee leads for the different goals. And so you can see on these two slides who has been identified so far for each of the, um, each of the goals. So we do have point people within the research subcommittee, some of whom are also SEC members. Um, who are working on uh, really trying to drive the research subcommittee's work around two um, major issues. So if we can move to the next slide. Good. So goal four. And then the next slide um, is really a, a succinct um, description of the charge of the um, research subcommittee which is really built around how, you know, as we're looking to achieve and maintain an age-friendly state for all Californians, um, there are two things that the research committee is particularly focused on. One, what are the recommended dashboard indicators? So how will we know where we are, where we're trying to go, and what progress we're making along the way, and are we doing that for everybody? So that's the first bucket of work that the research subcommittee is working on, and, and it's organized around each of the goals to come up with that set of uh, recommended indicators. And then the second bucket of work is really around, given that we know that we have imperfect information now, how can we improve our understanding over time by um, putting forth some recommendations around additional data and research work that can be done over the life of this 10-year master plan that we're all working on. So those are the, um, the main focus areas for the research subcommittee. And in order to carry that out, I'm going to highlight um, the way that the work is playing out for one of the goals, which no surprise is goal one, LTSS, um, the way that we are making sure that we are cross-pollinating back and forth with all the other work that's going on. The, um, as I said, the, the research subcommittee met in January around goal one. Um, a group of folks who were identified on the prior slide are working together to um, identify potential indicators, narrow that down to a recommended set of indicators, and bring that forward um, to the um, LTSS subcommittee on the 10th, and then to the equity work group on the 17th and then we'll be bringing feedback from those two sessions back to the research subcommittee after that point. So we're, going, we're, we're doing the work of um, making sure that we're kind of doing that cross-pollination. And I should say, as the work, uh, as each goal group is working on these candidate 
um, indicators and uh, prioritizing among them. Um, they are considering the recommendations and comments that have come in. And they are also, all of them have the equity work groups, um, equity tool in front of them as they're, as they're working on that as well. So we are trying to just bake that into the entire process as we move forward. Um, I don't know if any SAC members, I'm, I'm mostly looking at Donna. Is there anything, Dr. Benson, anything else you want to add? No, I mean, I, I would say, oh. Yeah, not, not Hi, this is Donna Benton. Um, one of the things that we really realized, of course, is that as you look to research, that there are a lot of gaps. And so that we actually are having a separate gap analysis coming through showing where do we need more data and, and how are we going to build that out. So I would say that that's turned into the, a big discussion for our group. Um, I just want Dr. Torres Gill to know that we have two UC Berkeley students <laughs> yeah. working on the research subcommittee. One is a joint medical student at UCSF and UC Berkeley, and the other is an undergraduate. So, yeah. Woo -woo, yeah. Cal represented. Yeah. 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 UCSF and UC Berkeley get along. You don't have to worry about mixing them and I, I, I want to just call out also uh, Terry Shaw is also doing a lot of work on the internal work with our partners at CDPH who have agreed to build the thing once all these uh, all this is designed uh, and then work with all of our department partners who actually have the data. Of course, CDA has very little of the aging and disability data. So there is a um, more work than you can probably imagine going on beyond the scenes and we're grateful to Terry to helping begin to support that. Okay, so I, I can't resist. As a Stanford grad, <laughs> we, we also had a research subcommittee meeting at Stanford in February, uh, hosted by Dr. Carstensen. So we are really making the round. <laughs> I don't know how I got this job. I didn't go to college in California. It's amazing. Yeah, happy to. Um, happy to. Any other research questions? Um, again, um, Research is up at, at Equity Workgroup next month and will be the focus of your next SAC meeting. We'll be hearing a lot from the research subcommittee as well as I finally got a goal to livable communities. Anything else for research? Okay, then for our last update, we're going to imagine June. We're in June. June. All that work has been done. Thing. Thank you. Goal two, goal three, goal four, research, equity. Now we're going to share it out with the state. Uh, on June 17th, we're going to be in this room. Uh, maybe it's a super webinar, super Wednesday webinar, uh, and we're going to be live streaming it in some way. And we had exactly one planning call so far uh, with, of course, Donna Benton, because Donna's on everything, uh, <laughs> and Susan DeMaris and Debbie Toth. And um, there was brainstorming is where we're at. Uh, we're hoping to get a save the date out in a couple weeks as we firm up some details. But do either of you, um, any of the three of you, want to share some initial what you, why you think this makes sense or what you're excited about about this sorry you were multitasking i'm sorry I just put you on the spot debbie or donna or susan if you're well, put susan on the spot okay. please sure i was li listening <laughs> the one thing i took away from that call it was late on a friday everyone was driving and it was one of those things too where we didn't want the meeting to end it went over so um i think what i heard is that we're building so much momentum and, and we want to make sure that we don't take a dip in the summer wait, while we wait for this October report that we keep the momentum going through the summer. Yeah. I'm going to put you on the spot for one more piece. What about the role of possible local chapters or local day centers? So, so we did do some, this is Debbie Toth from Choice and Aging, in case you don't recognize my voice by now. Um, so we did talk about how we make this truly a statewide multi-participatory opportunity so to capitalize on our congregate settings, whether it's senior centers, whether it's Alzheimer's Association offices, whether it's adult day health centers, whether it's senior living um, housing or all hospital partners. We had a pretty robust conversation about how we capitalize on the um, network of the Stakeholder Advisory Committee, but also back home, um, different service providers being able to bring their folks in so that we can have a really robust sort of outpouring of the information, but also being able to recognize all of the input that we've had thus far. And we talked about 
um, hopefully finding ways that we can collect and put on that call as w call webinar whatever superstar extravaganza event yeah I, I think this is Donna Benton I think we, we also discussed particularly on the online piece to try to use that at different levels um, and to go through different age groups I also want to say that one of the things that did come up and this came up in the equity work, work group is that if we do something in person we do have to be sensitive to there is a cost to bring people together for any event whether or not they're already current clients or not so and, um, and, and we thought about certain sponsors right right Brands. so we <laughs> felt that you know while we want to do this um, we don't want to pass the cost on because if you want to involve all of the communities you don't want to just pass the cost on immediately to the smaller agencies or larger or whatever but yeah uh, so I, I think this piggybacks on something that Bruce said earlier about uh, you know creating sort of a, a you know a public awareness of a, and sort of a you know, moving the public with us to help advance this could this be an opportunity and maybe you've already you know thought this through you know could this be an opportunity not just to give input to what they're hearing but actually use the opportunity as a call to action around the whole master plan and really use that as the opportunity to begin to then launch a real movement and uh, so you, um, so this sounds very exciting uh, and I'm having difficulty understanding how it will work <laughs> so it's great to think of having thousands of people listening in and I suppose engaging online, maybe questionnaires, kind of the polling, all of those things. But what is the room? What, it, what, it, what happens here in this room? Any thoughts on that, just sort of an outline, what it might look like? Because we could have, theoretically, hundreds of thousands of people join in. Any look at the balloons up? We can put up well, I'm being respectful that you guys are just be, <laughs> beginning to think about this. You know, I, I just want to, when we brought this up a couple times, and so I just want to remind us that this is not a master plan for the aged. We've said this many times. This is a master plan for aging. So we, sort of picking up on some of the comments, so these are more ideas and solutions. So one is, so how are we engaging folks who are not just older? So with all due respect to people who live in congregate communities and senior centers, we need a multi-generational strategy. So what could you, I'm just looking at you, Kim, because you have nothing better to do. <laughs> um, like, how do, we, how do we engage, I don't know, the, the poli-sci faculty in the Cal State system? Like, why couldn't this be an assignment where classes could listen in and do something around this? I just made that up because I'm, I'm like, well, what would be a good tactical example? But I think if we don't have an engagement strategy that's more than just, you know, people who are older now and people who advocate for older people, then we failed on our own metric. Now June's, June's basically here, and I recognize that might be very hard, and this may, be, this may be as much a harbinger for what we should do in October as what we do for June, but June could be a dress rehearsal for October. I think, um, I think the other piece sort of building off of Rigo's comment um, is this idea of longitudinality. So what are we asking people to do in June? Is there another run-up, is there a call to action between June and October that gets amplified in October? So I, I would just think about June in some ways is almost, you know, it's a chance to try some stuff. It's a chance for us to have a broader communications campaign, one that really is multi-generational, one that could be leveraged in October. You know, how do we keep people engaged um, and, and multi-generationally engaged? Um, so. Next. Okay. Jody, Jody Reed from CARA. Um, I think I signed up for this, but I obviously missed the first meeting, but I'm willing to help on this. And one of the things that we've, in an effort to try and engage people who are our members, who are around the state, one of the things that 
we've used and other people have used that I really want us to think about is especially as we're trying to engage people from uh, who have different language issues, different cultural issues, that this method is uh, doing like a centered event with outsourcing some stuff. The, the way it has worked the best for us is that we have some sites and that there's kind of a facilitator at those sites that has language competency, that has you know specific um, cultural competency with the group that they're engaging with so that something can be posed here, but there can be conversation there <laughs> that can then feed back in. Um, and so maybe we practice, you know, we're not going to be able to do everything um, in June, but that we practice trying some of that because if we really want people to be engaged and then you know, and I, I really appreciate the comments about ready to act because that's kind of what we do um, and what I want our folks to be able to do and to help support this work, that they have to be there, they have to feel a part of it. And just translating words is not good enough. It has to be talked about in a way that people are comfortable with. So maybe having some of that planned um, that if you want to come to a, a, a group that's going to be engaged and responding in Spanish, then here are a couple of sites that is that will be facilitating that. I'm just using that as an example. But I just th think about how we do this, and it may not be everything, but at least try some of that in June, and then think about how we push that out. I'm thinking about the people who will enact the master plan in the decades to come and how important those people are in this conversation. So I'm thinking about not only in June, but, in, but because right after um, graduation and they're all on holiday, they won't be available. But I'm thinking about the future healthcare professionals, the future caregivers, the future everybody. And if there would be some way for the governor to say this is aging day in California or whatever it is and have, a, have an effort where we reach out to community colleges, we reach out to poli sci, we reach out to all the different departments and universities, colleges, high schools, and there's like a study guide for people to have a conversation about the future and for them to really be thinking about their role in this because we're making up things that others will, will enact on our behalf and that's the group we have to engage now because I really wish when I was 15 someone had come to me and said I'm so happy you're working as a nursing assistant at night because you've got a future and I wish that we could do that for all those people out there who are raising their hands and are interested in the future of being part of this so I is to the extent we can inspire them I would really love that If I could just sort of bar, barge in really fast and just, I mean, Heather, you said in a much more eloquent way what I was trying to say. And I think this idea of longitudinality and really using the power of the governor's office to engage across generations and to, you know, to kind of set a different kind of discussion. And I think about the work of, of the um, equity work group, which is how do we really engage communities whose voices are never heard? And what is the structure for that engagement, right? So, um, this could be a really powerful opportunity and there could be cycles of input. I mean, I'd love to hear every school rank its top four or five. Prior. Like, there are ways that we can continue the discussion and maybe some of those people you know, at each level, whether you're a high school student, a college student, a graduate student, become fellows. Can't. Maybe there were a small subset of fellows where people would come work on a project for a period of time. But you can create an environment that's kind of self-engaging. We're creating the next generation of aging leadership. We're bringing in communities that are never heard from or hardly ever heard from or parts of the state like rural areas, which are always like, once we fix the urban areas, we'll get to you, that kind of stuff. So. This is a place to, to spend some time and, and, and frankly for there to be future investments, both from, I think, philanthropy and the private sector. Thank you, Judy. And I'll come down here. I'm so sorry. I'm just Kevin and Cheryl. So I had really similar thoughts. Um, I think the piece that hasn't been said that, that I would add to that is, you know, this group's pretty good at having high-level participants at it, and also I think the grassroots 
coalition is well represented, but we're kind of missing those middle policymakers. And in terms of implementing it, besides, the, besides Heather's comments and Bruce's comments with the educational component, I also think um, things like you know, rural cities or cities in general and, and county boards of supervisors, that they're a missing piece in this and to bring them along, they need some sort of event like this to give them the call to action if they haven't gotten it already. So I would include that group as part of what we try to do on June 17th and reach out to them because we know, you know delivery is going to happen at the local level and this is a way to get the policy leaders locally involved in the long term and the immediate plan. Uh, and just to, for our SAC members, we're going to do about just a few more minutes of comments and then we'll move to public comment. But just a friendly amendment, uh, Supervisor Catherine Barger is a SAC member from LA County and we've been working very closely with CSAC and CWDA and we actually presented at CSAC uh, a couple weeks ago and we're given about 10 minutes which is the monthly board meeting with a representative of the Board of Soup of all 58 counties. And we had, as appropriate, about 10 minutes on the agenda and about 45 minutes into it, I had to go. Uh, they were extremely, extremely engaged. So to your point, making it easier for our Board of Soups and other local leaders. Uh, but there's a huge amount of interest um, from that group to tap into and leverage. So ooh, Judy, you've been waiting. Uh, Judy Thomas, so kind of related to that, I was thinking what's an infrastructure that exists throughout the state that might have an interest in convening people locally and maybe have a little bit of money to put into it? And I thought about our legislature. So maybe there's a way to leverage them to having town hall meetings on June 17th. Mm -hmm. Y'all should have been on the call. <laughs> uh, what, Kevin? what date is June oh, 17th Cheryl, ahead, fall on? Yes. What day is June 17th? Oh, it's a Wednesday. You know we love our Wednesdays. <laughs> yeah. I just wondered because you know they're in session on Tuesday. Yeah. 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 Uh, Thursday. Yeah, a, a couple quick things. One on the intergenerational piece. We're actually working with a group of students at Cal State uh, East Bay um, <laughs> where they're doing projects around developing recommendations for the master plan. So I like Bruce's idea of trying to find some way to institutionalize that going forward. Um, I think also we'll be coming right off the budget on June 17th and hopefully it's an opportunity to celebrate some budget wins. <coughs> One that we haven't talked about here because the governor already has it in his budget is the expansion of Medi-Cal uh, to undocumented <coughs> and older adults and that effort was really led by young people and so maybe inviting them in to talk about that success and to celebrate that with us. Uh, I think we have to leverage press in this event. That's going to get us a lot farther than our rooms. And then I'd like to request, and maybe if the SAC collectively could request, it would be wonderful to see the governor. If we haven't seen him yet, it would be a great chance for him to come celebrate whatever he signed in the budget. And we won't have the plan done yet, so we wouldn't expect that he would be endorsing a plan. But I think the SAC should ask the governor to be with us that day to demonstrate his commitment. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, Nina? Last one. Nina Wilder Harwell, ARP. So I wasn't able to make the first call because I was on a plane back from the round table in Santa Inez. <laughs> so um, just a couple of thoughts, and I know we have another call, I think, next week. Um, let's just make sure, too, when we're bringing in various groups with all the money we're going to get to have a super duper, you know, listening session with no technical glitches. <laughs> that we're also thinking about bringing in potential, I have to talk to our folks, see if we can invite A or P chapters to, to listen in, um, independent living centers, the Santa Inez community would be fabulous. And I really do support the idea of a teaching guide, um, listening, and then really a facilitated conversation, more like a, like a watch party, yeah, mm -hmm. right? Um, and lots of other ideas that I'll share going forward. Well, I really appreciate this big, bold brainstorm. That's exactly where we are. Um, last word, Cheryl. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to remind you that on um, May the, ooh, what date is it? Uh, the senior rally. 11th. Sure. May 11th. Okay. May 11th would be a great time for us to practice or for us to get a little bit of um, an idea of how we're going to do June 17th, doing it um, on the Capitol and having people come out, having the adv advocates come. And um, I think Nina is speaking and, and um, Sarah. Yeah, I think they're all speaking. Okay. And I think that that would be a time when we could really get the legislators to come out and just get a little snippet 
of what we've been doing all this time. That will give them a little um, impetus to go back to their communities and have the town hall that you were talking about. But you have to have a reason for them. You have to get them excited about what you're doing. Yes, and uh, we will um, take all this brainstorming back. There is a biweekly call series that has just started. If we left you out, thank you, Jody, so noted. Uh, drop me and Ellen a note. Um, the other part of this, uh, Amanda Lawrence, I mentioned she started at 9 a.m. this morning. This will be Amanda's, will be your point to help figure out what is that big, bold vision that leverages a packed celebratory room here, but also is meaningful engagement locally. I think that was exactly the conversation we had that talks about local leadership, a resource kit, and possible actual fiscal resources to pay for food in some nominal way at least. Um, our next step is, is writing up this concept, taking it to the equity work group to really help us um, shape it, and then by the end of March, having a plan and being able to start announcing it and recruiting leaders and recruiting sites um, with the resources we have, the timeline we have, but absolutely see it as a critical moment. So more to come on that, but uh, you got in on the ground floor and gave us a lot of great energy and ideas, and we will take it and run and come back to you. Okay, that was a whirlwind tour of uh, all things uh, master plan. We do want to open it up to public comment for at least 10 minutes, if not longer. Um, can you check on the, on the phone, Nelson? Um, no one on the phone yet. And then we've got Marsha and Ellen working the room. And I'll, uh, we usually ask folks to aim for about two minutes. Thank you for being with us all day or part of the day. Um, and to just give everyone a chance. That's great if you can aim for two. Uh, this is Jeff, an advocate. Here at the first meeting, I will offer this. What is missing right now is that consumer. If you had had a consumer, you would on your long term understood that part of the problem is having to relocate to accommodate your caregiver to do the other services and things. Because you had no consumer, that insight was not offered to you. I bring that to your attention. I also see with Kim, she's got a number of other commissions and other groups. I see no mention about the OM, was it Omnibusman, and other programs that you have currently going on in the Department of Aging that you have no input through there. Uh, right now, in response to your intergenerationals, a suggestion, if the, any of you are here for March 11th when there is another hearing, that will be taking place, I believe, at 1.30 in the afternoon in 4202. But if you get here earlier, the UCC Center, this is where they will have their student policy procedures. They do quarterly, and this is an example of your brightest of the UC campuses. Political science policy makers meet, and they are coming up with things. I invite you to consider, because maybe that's something, again, your Department of Resources might see if you can get them in for either summer or fall time to do something related to this Department of Aging. Um, you would have had these comments back on February 19th, but again, as public comment, it was cut off. So just alerting to you is, is there are so many things that you are missing. There are so many things you don't have uh, in there right now. I will be Wednesday because there is going to be an oversight hearing dealing with for natural disasters of how we are unprepared. It offer, may again offer you some insight of how else Department of Aging might look at unprepared. To me, what I am finding disappointed is you don't have a call to action right now this year for the budget for between now and June and for next January's budget right now. You should do this and have, whether it's the oversight, whether it's pre-funding of money, what I have participated in, in for we have and was called the Older Women's League Valentine. So in that one, we put in there about the Elder Index because many people, legislators, do not understand the Elder Index. And we also put them, please pre-fund the master plan on aging. And those are things you could redo. Oversight you could be doing. These are things all important right now to get in functioning, working. And as I offered back then, we started timelines. You've done, I think, an incredible job. But there's so much more. 
that you need to be focused on and doing. I worked with uh, Kim last year on CalFresh mm -hmm. and the program and things that came through there. Only four committees going together. A lot of work, year timeline, August through here. And what I asked for in January was some form of a feedback, you know, to see how we're looking. Apparently, the uh, CalFresh group decided that it was important to meet quarterly. So it's just an insight to you with things that, you know, you need some way of connecting about going on beyond just perhaps your oversight. Thank you. Marsha. Hi, I'm, I'm Greg DeGere with the ARC of California. Um, my, uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for, for your, your work and your interest in, in this incredibly important uh, subject. Um, my interest in uh, crimes against people with disabilities, which includes, of course, disabilities caused by aging, goes back about 15 years when I was working at the Senate Office of Research. Hi, Peter. Um, and so it was kind of an academic interest at first. I found a, a, a large, it's kind of stunningly large body of, of research about the extent of, of crimes that go unreported and un, unprotected against the people. I came across one, I didn't came across one, there was one California study, which I'll, I'll quote just one little bit of it. Lack of reporting occurs for various reasons, including that the criminal justice system cannot or will not serve those with disabilities. Therefore, it is entirely appropriate to, ter to refer to people with disabilities who are victimized as invisible victims. As such, they have historically and in the present day been systematically denied access to justice via the criminal justice system. That was, uh, I think, uh, 2003, and um, there has been some progress since then. The legislature has passed some, some bills. Uh, also, since 2003, the, the, governor and the governors and the legislatures have repealed or, or, or eliminated the mandatory training of police officers on elder and dependent adult abuse and uh, eliminated other programs. It is, these studies used words like appalling, uh, shocking, so forth. Um, where it really sunk into me, though, was when I actually talked to somebody who, a woman who uh, said she had been victimized. I'm not sure what it was. I think it may have been sexual assault. Uh, called the police, Sacramento Police Department, and nothing happened. Nothing happened. And that was 15 years ago. Um, and then there was another study uh, came up just a few years ago in Nash. This one was a national study of the uh, crime victims with disabilities. Uh, 50, I think it was 53 percent said that, that they reported it to authorities, nothing happened. Um, I, I, I was one of the people who put together the, uh, the letter, I hope all of you have seen it, signed by 20 organizations, asking for 28 very specific uh, actions, recommendations, uh, in the field of what the statute now calls uh, senior and disability victimization which is elder and dependent adult abuse and goes, goes well beyond that too. Um, I, I really hope that you will uh, look at every single recommendation from them and from the Elder Justice Coalition and from the California uh, Elder uh, Justice um, for, uh, for Justice in Aging, many others that you get, and come up with a really comprehensive plan. We don't, we don't need more little incremental steps that fit somebody's budget. We need a comprehensive plan. And for, for, for those who work for the administration, of course, you have a moral and ethical responsibility to respond to the governor, whatever directions you get from the governors. But from, from this, this group, we're at you and all of us are advocates. When the governor appointed you, I doubt he said to any single one of you, we want you to give us some advice, but don't give us any advice that's going to cost very much. He knew what he was getting, and, and we should we should we should uh, uh, put it, uh, come up with a plan that is really comprehensive. This is the beginning of it. It's 28 points. If there's anything in here that you think is a bad idea, don't do it. But if uh, short of that, I'd like to see every point in here included in, in your report, which the administration is then free to do with whatever it wants. Likewise, the other recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, Marissa Shaw with Hand in Hand, and you heard me before. Um, I basically I have a question. Um, but I don't know. I don't mind which one of you answers it. But basically, I saw your goals, and they're extensive. Good luck with that. 
So um, my question is, um, are people from the public able to sit on these subcommittees or assist you in the subcommittee? So the people from the, I'm sorry, the, are you asking about the, the, it's a very different answer panel on things. So on goal two, three, four, those work yes. groups, those yes. are SAC work groups that are meeting independently. So the feedback they are taking is from the uh, recommendations, the public comment and the webinar Wednesday, and then they're bringing it back to SAC in May. Equity is a publicly held meeting. Research is a publicly held meeting. LTSS is a publicly held meeting, and uh, this today, the Stakeholder Advisory Committee, is a publicly held. So it's it's a there's there's both things happening. Hear your question. Are ordinarily people on the committee? She didn't hear you. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So uh, did did you did you hear my question? I did my best to answer it, but if I missed it, let me try again. So okay, because I don't know. So basically, Paul is not doing us any favors. I'm sorry. Let me. Leave so, over. We'll see you and hear you. So basically, I'm asking: Can people from the public assist you on, on those on those uh, four subcommittees? I don't know what you call them. <laughs> um, yes, the current mechanism for public input to the work groups is the public comment, the recommendations, the written. I think if you're asking about joining the work group, um, that hasn't been contemplated. But we can take it back to the captains, and captains can look at who is currently on their work groups, which is currently SAC members. LTSS members, research members, and equity members make up those work groups and look at whether there's an opportunity for more members or public. You've heard consumer voices here, but at this point, the work groups are made up of existing members of committees. So basically, I'm not trying to belabor this not, point, go ahead, go ahead. but basically, I'm asking: Do you, do these do these groups have an at-large position? No. Um, maybe you ought to consider that because, for okay, uh, I I think you need I think I think these groups need to be expanded a little bit. Um, I don't know the woman's name, but when when I re-entered the room this afternoon, I didn't know that um, uh, people of color don't like to be called that. I didn't, you know, my point is that <laughs> I'll speak for myself, but and you may not like this, but. People with disabilities don't like um, not having their own self-representation. Mm -hmm. There's a phrase within the disability community, uh, nothing about us without us. Yes. And when we are not, we, when we're physically not able to, or when we're not able to join the conversation, then when it looks like, I'm going to say it, but it looks like a bunch of able-bodied do-gooders that are trying to help out our community. But when when a community is not represented, it looks really bad. So, and I know that everybody in this room is not trying to do that, but but there needs to be um, at large positions because, you know, you talked about commu different communities and what that looks like. You're talking about um, aging in place, you're, you know, and you're talking about um, diff you know different aspects of ways to potentially spend a pot of money, um, and I heard some of that, like vision, uh, LTS, so forth, but the interesting thing about that, when I heard that conversation earlier this afternoon, durable medical equipment wasn't raised at all. You're right. Not at all. You're right. Okay. Um, That's why I had to leave out of the room. I think every, every community has that to some extent, but people with disabilities, we're not going to be able to leave our house without um, some durable medical equipment. Right. I can't even use my bathroom without durable medical equipment. Right. So this is what I'm talking about. And sort of the last comment Equity. is that's really kind of scary is you don't know what you don't know. So therefore, because you don't know, I really strongly suggest that you um, think about um, an at-will position or maybe several at-will positions um, because, and I'm not trying to toot my horn, well, I am a little, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I mean, like, yes, I'm an advocate for my community and I, I've been an advocate uh, for the last 30 years, um, but other than being an advocate, I, I, well, I'm a graduate of Berkeley, so, 
Um, and I have a master's in public policy, so this is kind of right up my alley. I mean, I could sit here, and a lot of my friends could sit here, and I'll sit at the website, um, you know, and make comments. But the thing about it is, is that I think there's something about being physically present. Because let me tell you, if I didn't think that was important, I wouldn't have shown up this mm-hmm. morning. Mm-hmm. I could have done something else. But um, but I think this is important, and I think you guys all should think about um, what that looks like in terms of um, do you want a, um, a seat at large? If you do, what's that going to look like? How many you want at large? Yep. You have an arduous task in front of you, and I think it would behoove the, sub, uh, the, the I don't know what you call them, the four, the four categories to think about that, because otherwise uh, I, you got a lot of work ahead of you. Yes. No, I want to thank you 100% for that input and feedback. Uh, so a couple different points in there. We are absolutely committed to that ethos and have taken great steps to be as representative and diverse, and there's always more to be done. So I think as an immediate first step, we can post who is on the goal two and three and four work groups so people can see who that is and see that there has been an initial attempt in pulling from the 100 or so folks who are on SAC LTSS research and equity, that there has been an attempt to be inclusive and diverse. So we could at least put some more transparency on that. It doesn't speak to your second point about whether there isn't more to be done. Uh, And just in that same vein, the equity work group, we went out twice to get the right mix. We went out once and 35 people applied uh, and we appointed most of them, but we did not have representatives from the tribal community or the disability community. So we went back out and got 35 more applications and appointed two more people to make sure that group was uh, representative. So we can take that to the work groups. The captains, I hope you're hearing all this and thinking about who you have at your work group table, how we could broaden and diversify that, how we can add transparency, how we could have meaningful engagement. Um, I think everybody wants to do that. I think everyone's struggling with, unfortunately, just timelines, but that's no excuse. We can do better and do more, and uh, we will. Great. Other, I know we're at three, but that was a, let's do a couple more. How many more in the room do we think we have? One, terrific. Two, two in the room and then, oh great, and then I'll try to do my best to sum it up. Yes. Okay, so uh, so a theme that we've, we've heard today very frequently is this idea of outreach. Uh, there's this huge public out there that uh, isn't aware of this crisis that's coming on. How come people aren't? How come the public isn't aware of this? And I think I think the reason the public isn't aware of this is because it's a very very uncomfortable thing to think about. People don't have pensions anymore. People don't have savings anymore. I mean, my family's trying to get through. Two of two of my three kids, uh, their struggle is to get get through the end of the month, not to get into agehood. And so, you know, you think about how they got into that position. Their wages have been stagnated. Their their defined uh, pensions, defined benefit pensions have been taken away. They've been basically pauperized. Mm -hmm. So no wonder they don't want to think about preparing, you know, for for when they're old or when when they're disabled. And so, you want to design a program that now, and of course it's going to be driven by the budget. But when you think about this and where the funding is going to come from, I would suggest to you that when you talk about a progressive, a progressive funding mechanism, what you're really doing is trying to take back what's been stolen from us. afternoon, Lorinda Reynolds, American River College, and I want to thank all of you for your fantastic work. The progress is amazing. Um, I put my comments pretty much in the chat um, throughout the meeting today, um, but I do want to address two things, age-friendly university. Um, I, I put in the chat the link to the Gerontological Society of America page on the age-friendly university you movement. Pot- Nelson, can you, Nelson, can you show the chat? Is it, so we can just see some of that. We should have had that video um, 
Continue, Lauren. Yeah. Excuse me to interrupt. I want so, to the, the age-friendly university movement is really clear, clearly um, addressed by their web page, and it has the 10 precepts in that. So there's a link in the chat to that. Um, and I encourage you all to visit it. Also, uh, the Gerontological Society of America launched on their website a course called Ageism First Aid, and all the stakeholders and all the subcommittee members have been added to a VIP user list so that you can take the course and find out exactly what it contains. It addresses uh, promotion of the field of aging and employment. It teaches about programs for older adults. It addresses how ageism is developed. It also educates people on what aging really is. And it contains a module of communication training that includes cultural competency, ableism, and all of the things that are on your agenda um, as knowledge gaps in the workforce. It's written in um, language at 6th to 10th grade level, so it's accessible to people of all ages and it has no professional terminology to speak of. So you're all there. I, I forwarded an email to Ellen um, so that she can send you all the links okay. and I hope that that helps address some of the concerns about ageism that came up today. Thank you. Thank you for the resource and the partnership. Much appreciated. All right, uh, we are right at the other person. Yeah. Last comment. Thank you. Yeah, I'll try to be real brief. My name's Keith Umamoto, and uh, I applaud everybody here because I know you have a special interest in serving um, the aging population. And uh, I, I think a few days ago you had demographic information about the, the growth of the aging population. Uh, historically, a um, little bit of background, I used to be on the Senate Budget Committee. I worked for a guy named Senator Al Alquist. He augmented the Alzheimer's daycare center at $20 million, and that is no longer there. Yep. So we, as indicated earlier, we haven't gotten back to where we were Right. Yet, the problem is exponentially higher now than ever before. And in fact, Senator Alquist at that time indicated where there was an AIDS pandemic, not, nothing against AIDS, but the number of people with Alzheimer's was greater, greater than the number of people right. with AIDS. And we know factually it's exponentially worse today. So to me, part of the exercise really has to be how do you develop the resources to support at least um, augmenting and, and taking care of the, the aging population that is growing dramatically over time. Mm -hmm. And some of those will be cost-benefit analysis. If you do certain services, in-home care is a lot cheaper than 24-7 um, skilled nursing facility mm -hmm. care if you could delay it with appropriate care. But at the same time, we know both populations are growing, so it's not cutting that, but showing the governor that if you don't do this, this is where it's going to skyrocket on the entitlement programs that are going to be demanded on either the, the Medicare side or at the federal level, the Medicare side. So anyway, um, everyone's, you got a brilliant group here, and part of the brilliance of the group, I think, really has to tie to how do we fund programs based upon where we're going to be? Because to me, a strategic plan, a master plan, projects out that the aging population is growing, and that means the demand for resources is going to increase. Thank you very much. Thank you. Perfect summation of where we are. So uh, thank you all for uh, incredibly productive. Both we went wide and we went deep, and we mostly stayed on time. Um, just a very quick run through. Of course, we will be, um, I, I heard from our team that the, the action ready items is already posted on our website. The grid will come soon. Progress report with any feedback. Remember, this is our soft launch. Any feedback, we'll get that up in a couple days and the slides will be corrected and reposted. That's the easy stuff. The big thing is the LTSS action that you all voted on. So look for the new draft, the new uh, transmission letter coming to equity, coming to SAC, so much more to come week by week by week. Uh, very exciting. We'll also spend some time on goal two, three, four, getting that leadership, getting that membership, making sure you have all the recommendations, really getting the foundation right. So thank you to all the comments, including the public comment on that. Equity, you're rolling. 
got lots to do. Uh, next content continues. Research is also continuing. We'll be deciding uh, this plan on the June 17th with all the input by the next end of the month, doing some thinking about our two May meetings, 10 days apart, May 18th and May 28th, both going on goal two, goal three, goal four, and dashboard, but also having these ageism conversations, these intergenerational conversations, the dementias conversations and cognitive health. How do we do both? So we'll think, do some meeting co-creation. And then so much to say, many of us are going to ASA at the end of March. There'll be two master plan workshops there. To, so thank you to oh. Justice and Aging and West Health for uh, making that happen. That's very exciting. And if, maybe we'll have a meetup in Atlanta for those of us who are going. Uh, and thank you for the GSA uh, resources. We'll send those out as well with our connections to our professional community. And then so, sounds like many of you will get together and talk budget on your own time. So <laughs> otherwise, I'll see you at the budget hearing on Thursday, right, Clay? Uh, it's our first budget hearing. Uh, that's my list. Anything else to add or correct? Is anybody going to the airport? If anyone's going to the airport, uh, see Cheryl. If anyone wants to decompress with the CDA team, you are invited. Have a great one. Thank you. Thank you. Did, did everybody see the transportation?